What's up, guys? This is Coach Donnie with ElevateYourself.org. Welcome to another episode of The Dig, where we talk about everything from volleyball, training, and dig deeper into the life behind the athlete. And today's guest is Chris Vu, who is a strength and conditioning coach who's worked with many indoor USA Volleyball indoor and beach athletes. He also runs his own strength and conditioning company down in Orange County. He also plays indoor, he's played indoor, he's played beach, and my favorite, he also plays nine-man volleyball. So Chris, why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself? Yes. Um, hey guys, my name is Chris Vu, and I'm a strength and conditioning specialist and a volleyball coach. Um, yeah, like Donnie said, I do a little multitude of things. So uh, just working with the national team for a couple seasons um, and still writing programs for athletes right now. And training a lot of athletes inside the USA gym. So kind of getting them ready for the FIVB World Tour, um, the AVP, the World Championships, and also the Olympic Games. So it's a little bit of what I do on that end. Um, and just kind of, you know, running, a, helping run a company down in Orange County called Alpha Athletics, where we train a lot of indoor volleyball athletes um, at the high school and collegiate level. And then coaching at West Cliff University for the men's and women's beach volleyball program. So that's just kind of an up and coming program right now that we're trying to build and get going. Um, and lastly, I guess just working with a company called Beach Volleyball Consulting. So with that, we are reaching to a wide number of girls all across the U.S. and wherever else around the world that wants to get recruited to play Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three, even um, in in the NCAA. So I work with a group of highly specialized. Uh, selected individuals um, within their own uh, perspective fields and we kind of get these athletes ready and geared up to get picked up from colleges and so by the time they're there they're mentally physically and ready to just get going and succeed at the highest level so yeah it's all volleyball but they're all in the same capacity of being a strength coach and a volleyball coach in general. So Chris uh, tell us how you got into volleyball. Um, man uh, probably Definitely started in middle school. Start off as I think a PE class of some sort, and just thought it was really fun. And at some point, you know, at that time, wasn't really into volleyball. I just thought it was a fun keep the ball off the floor kind of sport. And um, I was, you know, a multi-sport athlete growing up, playing a lot of different things. And once I got to high school, I think basketball, um, soccer, and football was was kind of in my eye right there. And um, I guess one weekend after basketball practice, one of our high school coaches who also played at our high school, he used to play volleyball as well. And he talked to the, to the coach at the time that, Hey, can my basketball guys try out for fun? I'd really like them to explore the sport. Um, and I'm very thankful that he got us to do that because all of this wouldn't have happened. So yeah, I just tried out um, that weekend and had a lot of fun with it. I guess they saw some potential and that's how I made into a high school team at that point. And then kind of just played all throughout high school, had some successful years there, and then transferred out, um, played community college level at Golden West College, um, won a state championship there, which is really fun, and then transferred out, um, eventually just went and played in the club team at Long Beach State and had some fun final four experiences there uh, at Nationals. So, and the rest is history, still playing, still competing a little bit here and there in tournaments, and of course, nine man. Uh, but that's really it. And what, what position do you play? So I've always been a, a, an outside, so like a small outside in libero. Um, but a lot of times, I've really, like most small athletes, became very crafty and skilled in general. So I've tried set for a bit. And just um, I think most of the time in college, I played libero. Uh, but in high school and so on, just played outside. Um, and I think for nine man, I've just kind of moved around a little bit to see what's best fit every year as we're always bringing in new people. So I guess just, uh, just a handy man kind of moving around see where it is, but I, I guess I take pride in that as well. Yeah, definitely. And Chris plays for the LA mad dogs, right? For all the nine man fans. Uh, actually LA fresh, LA fresh. Sorry. <laughs> I'm so, <laughs> so used to LA having one team for so long. Yeah. So every time I say LA is just mad dogs. So yeah, you guys can hit him up at Nationals so if you guys want to talk to him. Um, hopefully, we'll still have it happening this year if things are, are going all right. Yeah, definitely. 
So thanks for sharing your background in volleyball. And we do have a lot of trainers uh, who do listen to the show and fans of the channel. So if you can share how you actually got into strength and conditioning and how you ended up steering towards volleyball. Um, so with strength and conditioning, I, I kind of knew that I wanted to go this route, but at first I wasn't very sure. And I think a lot of, uh, young aspiring, whether just personal trainers for general population or strength coaches for athletes in general, I think a lot of them don't really have a clear route, um, right off the bat. So that was for me when I first went into college and I just kind of stuck with kinesiology, still not knowing if that was exactly what I wanted to do. Um, but I right off the bat just signed up for that major once I got into school and stuck it out and took a lot of different classes that revolved in that um, in that major. And I think at first I signed up actually for athletic training, thinking that that was what strength and conditioning was. So I think the first month or two I was in an athletic training class watching a ton of injury videos and uh, just a bunch of rehab stuff. And at one point I was just thinking, man, I, I don't want to. I don't want to be on site, you know, dealing with potentially really catastrophic injuries. Yeah. And, um, and then I went and talked to the counselor and asked them, well, what, what's a little bit more hands-on of being in the weight room? So we switched it over eventually and finished out that, that before I transferred to Long Beach. <clears throat> um, and once I was there, uh, they have a really excellent kinesiology program with great professors. And so... I really got to dive a little bit more deeper into it as the years went on. And that really grew the love for the, the work in general. So a lot of time in the biomechanics lab, um, a lot of time, in different weight rooms, a lot of time in different group fitness classes, even. Um, and actually I think most of our classes in our internships that were um, provided and were um, must do's for our program was with the general population or with people with, different uh you know illnesses and uh, diseases so although that was really educational and fun I didn't think that that was exactly what I do I still want to work with athletes you know right from the start I kind of knew that um and that probably honestly started at a young age just watching a lot of different athletes at their games when they compete on tv or even Gatorade commercials and seeing them in the weight room and in the lab I always found that fascinating so I think just that the love for that in general grew from a very young age and especially being an active athlete of different sports. Um, and once the years went on towards my, my second to last and last year, I did a lot of different unpaid um, free internships at different places that were very just sports specific uh, sports performance training centers. So lots of driving, lots of early mornings, late nights and just free work. But you know, it, it really paid off later on because if I didn't do that, um, the companies I'm with now, you know, wouldn't see that in my background or would have reached out to me or taken me. So, um, pretty much did that. And then within my last year, I started applying around cause I, I had the credentials. Um, I, I took some of those things while I was in college, which is really nice cause I knew I wanted to work already. And so alpha athletics in orange County was kind of the first place I started working officially, um, not as an internship. And then within my last year, um, you know, some, somehow, some way it kind of happened. I, I woke up one Saturday morning and got an email from uh, the strength coach over at USA Beach Volleyball. And uh, that was really interesting because to this day, I, I honestly don't know how that happened. Um, uh, I think, so we had a nutrition for, uh, performance professor at Long Beach State. And she, I found later on, she was friends with uh, Sean, who is the dietitian for the national team. Um, for the U.S. Olympic Committee specifically. So she's working with a lot of different sports um, in that realm for the men's and women's side. So I guess they knew each other. I'm going to guess somehow some way things got relayed over or something. They maybe shared some of my projects or some of my work over. And I guess they reached out and said, um, hey, you know, we were looking in the L.A. area because they're based out of Torrance. So they were looking at schools like UCLA, USC, Northridge, and um, Long Beach State wasn't really on their radar. But I guess some for some reason he he just felt like he had to reach out, so he reached out. They kind of put me to that top of the list, which was nice, and they invited me in. Um, and from there, just just the day when I walked in, they just wanted me to check it out, see if I liked it or not. I don't have to take it; they just want to invite me in. So that happened, and obviously I told them, as a you know, growing up playing volleyball, I'll take it. I don't care about the drive. I don't care where it is. I even said on the phone before I came in, like. 
I, I'm in. You don't have to tell me twice. Um, just let me know when and where. So showed up and they kind of offered on the spot. Um, and that, the rest was kind of history from there and then just made all these different connections along the way and have just continued to be uh, like a lifelong learner from different people. So, you know, they, they've got a great group of, um, uh, you know, like bo body care specialists, so, you know, chiropr uh, chiropractors, PPTs, ATCs, um, you know, different strength coaches on staff from different sports and uh, Olympic training centers that come by. Um, there's even, you know, dietitians and sports psychologists. So it's really nice to be, to have been in that kind of realm where there's so many people to learn from because um, there's so many things that, you know, even I don't know. So um, it's really nice to be able to do that. And I think that's a huge thing for any strength coach in general or a therapist of, of, of some sort to just continue to surround yourself with people much smarter than you because that's just going to keep you on your toes and it's going to force you to learn things and um, kind of see things in a different perspective. I think that, um, you know, to continue to learn and grow, we have to understand that uh, what is conventional now, so, you know, used to be unconventional. So that's always a reoccurring thing. And yeah, just, just you know, it's just how you see it, you know, if, uh, within your personality. Um, I think your personality is your personal, you know, your, what is it called? They said that um, your personality is your personal reality, right? So yeah. how you kind of see things and put yourself out there, you, that's what you project into the world. And you know, that's, you know, that's how it comes back to you. So if you're really negative, pushing information away, don't really want to take it, even if it seems really odd at first and you've never heard of it. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, good energy comes back when you can just decide, all right, I'm just going to let it in, soak it in, learn, and then take it how I see it, all right? So that's just a little tip out there. But yeah, that's how I kind of got into the strength and conditioning field and have stayed into it. Yeah, that's, that's such an awesome journey. And I appreciate all the detail and the life tidbits that you shared. You know, one thing, common theme that I've seen along among a lot of other uh, great trainers as yourself is the grind. Like the head strength and conditioning uh, coach at for Sacramento Kings for NBA. And then Paul Favorites, um, James Harden's uh, personal trainer. They've all just, one, it started with a passion to just help athletes done tons of free work and for them it is really not free because you feel like you're getting the experience that's your payment and you get access to you know amazing athletes and then you also got to go through the other grind which is you know you even though your goal is to work with specific volleyball athletes probably gonna have to go through a time period where you're gonna have to work with the general population and yeah, I remember, yeah. and you know that, and that might be a good exposure too because you might want to work with that group and not know it uh, but I think for most people who are pretty serious athletes, um, that is kind of the phase that you just have to go through. And it, it's it's not going to be the most engaging, but that's where you get your your work in. That's where you get your experience in. And that's how you get your name out there. Um, and one thing I think was great that you shared is how you just were very present with every stage in your development and being connected. And I, I think networking has a very negative stigma to it because it sounds very salesy but i think true new networking at its core it just simply means are, are you a learner or do or do people enjoy working with you because everyone's going to have a different methodology and at the end of your time with that trainer or that group are you going to leave a good impression with them so that when you're when there is a need they're going to throw your name out there and it looks like you planted a lot of great seeds so that your name people throw that around now and, and are happy to refer you so that's, that's really great. Yeah, definitely. I think networking is a huge thing. Um, I think in general, yeah, in college, there was just a huge time to network. Uh, even, you know, I, it's, I think it's really uh, underlooked a little bit for a lot of people when they're in college is, you know, they just want to hang out, go to school, um, just go about their day and not really spend a whole lot of time knowing people um, on campus because you're just a number, right? Especially if you're at a big school. So I, I do think networking is a huge, huge piece of the puzzle to, you know, long-term sustainable success. So, and, you know, long after, you know, within your different fields, maybe you're only working at, like for me, at a certain facility for an X amount of months back then for internships or only a year or two. But it's, it's crazy how I've been able to reconnect or keep connections at these different facilities of different trainers, even if they're just owners. Um, 
And honestly, even clients, I mean, I, I still keep in contact with some of the, the elderly clients, you know, sometimes one of them actually called me um, two or three weeks ago just to check up on me. And I met this guy at my very first internship ever. Yeah. And he's so awesome. And I still keep in touch with him all the time. And actually his granddaughters play volleyball and they're trying to get, you know, get better, p- picked up and recruited. And so it's crazy. And some of the people I work with now have kids and they're trying to, you know, play volleyball. So just, just really, really cool to be able to connect back with some of these people. Man, that's awesome. Yeah. The relationships, that's, that's half the enjoyment seeing people get better, but also meeting people and, and, and really adding value to that level. And mm-hmm. one, one interesting tidbit you also added was how you started off as athletic training and then realized that I'm not going to be, I don't want to be as injury prevention focus or rehab. I want to work with performance enhancement. So I know for me, when I first went to college, even though I majored in art, I remember when I was exploring at that time, a lot of my friends who wanted to go into strength and conditioning and work in performance enhancement, they were, it sounds like you had a great counselor because a lot of counselors who, not to their fault, aren't really well versed unless you work with a kinesiologist specific department. And even then, you got to get lucky to get connected with a counselor that knows what you want. Mm -hmm. So they'll steer you in either athletic training, which is, it's from my friends, what they told me, it's a lot of taping, a lot of uh, levels of identifying ankle sprains and going through protocol, uh, things like that. And then The other end is like physical therapy, which is an extension, right? Strength and conditioning coaches do have to have a lot of physical therapy protocol, but it's, it's, you know, I feel like sports performance is kind of somewhere in between. Uh, So for the, those who are out there who want to be a strength and conditioning coach like Chris, just know that there is a difference between athletic trainer and physical therapy. Um, And unfortunately, I don't think there is a specific strength and con- I think only a few universities have that right like a very s- set uh strength and conditioning path or a major usually from, from what I, people I've known they usually have, go through kinesiology internships then get their SNC certifications and then go forward is that usually how they go about it yeah that's usually how they go about it I mean um like at Long Beach State they've uh, before, when I was there, basically my thing came down to health and fitness specialist. So that's my, that's my, um, my, what's my degree in. And I guess the extension I on, if you go to grad school, then it would be, uh, exercise science and nutrition is the next one. Mm-hmm. But if you go say down the road to Cal State Fulton, who's, who has an excellent kinesiology program, they have a strength and conditioning route and they actually have a, a, a master's degree in strength and conditioning as well. So they've got, um, you know, go beach, but I do know uh, Fullerton has an amazing facility with awesome biomechanics labs and human performance stuff. So that's where actually uh, uh, Paul for Brits goes for mm-hmm. some of the times he goes there and brings his athletes because it's down the road from uh, ASC. Yeah. So he goes and does a lot of testing there because he has connections. Um, but I do know a lot, uh, quite a few people who came out of that uh, institution there. Uh, and funny fact that you talked about the um, – Sacramento Kings strength and conditioning coach. So the strength coach that actually reached out to me and who mentored me um, along the way, who's a great mentor, uh, probably one of my, probably the best uh, strength and conditioning mentor I ever had um, as a coach, as a, um, just a figure, a role model, and also just bringing a lot of wealth and knowledge. He's just the full package. Um, but he actually, after about a year or so, he left and took the opportunity with the strength, uh, with the Kings. So He's the assistant strength coach up there over the Kings. So they've just got an awesome staff, I know for sure. Yeah. But um, yeah, de- definitely. And I think it's funny you mentioned about the counselor stuff mm-hmm. because I, man, I think my first two encounters uh, at, at that co- community college level I had two counselors that steered me in the wrong direction. And funny enough, I actually finished school in six years. I didn't finish in four years, but I finished in six years. Because my first year or so is just, I got, I started taking classes that they assigned me to. I didn't even need to take. And that's what really sets you back. And, you know, I have to do summer classes and stuff to try to catch up. Um, you know, but funny enough, by the time I finished school, I only needed one class in the, my final spring semester. So that's what held me back as well. And it was only spring offered. But um, yeah, it, it, it's definitely true. I would honestly, for people out there, go, go and seek multiple counselors if you can like try to get an opinion of one 
try to get one or another because you'll just pick up some nuggets that really speed you along the way because I don't think I would have gotten out of the, the ATC route if mm-hmm. I didn't go and find somebody else to help me along the way. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> Man. It was and, crazy. And be honest, because you played for the club team at Long Beach, right? Yeah. I would say majority of the guys I know, because I played club ball at San Jose State, and we all yeah. stayed six years so we can maximize our eligibility. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, that that wasn't my plan. It just kind of turned out that way. But it's yeah. hilarious. That's probably true. That's the junkie mentality. Like, yeah, when, uh, volleyball, volleyball becomes a number one priority, sometimes to a detriment. <laughs> oh yeah, no, definitely. You and I probably both know so many people who have really extended their playing career because of that kind of stuff. Yeah, like in the I mean, NCA is is much less uh, like that. Because, I don't, you know, probably because they there's a much better balance of athletics. But for club volleyball, I was so happy to be part of that circuit. But it's like, oh, you know, yeah, you solid player, man. Where'd you, you know, how long have you been playing for? You know, that's like I'm 26. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> been I'm around. <laughs> that's and so that's, that's true. I mean, there were guys playing on the club team that I've been to watch before. Right, Long Beach is local, so I had a lot of friends who went there. Yeah, And I remember seeing some of the games, seeing certain guys from like different schools and then being there for, you know, three years or so and seeing those same guys just play all that time. So, yeah, it's pretty funny. Um, definitely, definitely some guys that played that probably didn't even enroll in the school either. You know, that happens sometimes. So, Dude. yeah, funny stuff. You know, we went through, uh, we had a couple infractions on our team for uh... – <laughs> falsely reported enrollment because guys just wanted to play <laughs> that's funny you know it's funny enough um at long beach state we were banned for like a year or something my first year when i transferred there yeah because apparently <laughs> the prior year their their b team was completely illegal so oh, what happened man. was they brought all the long beach city guys over uh-huh. who, who's, a, who's a they have a great men's program too at the community college level um, and they're really talented. I think they won state champs the year before we won at Golden West. Wow. So they brought all these guys over um, who are really good. And then this B team just went and destroyed all these A teams, you know, <laughs> all throughout nationals and over in the tournament in Vegas. So finally the ref went and checked, like, who are these guys? So <laughs> got, bust, got busted. And then, yeah. So Long Beach just has this bad uh, rep from that. Oh, man. You know, at San Jose State – we had a few guys that would just take, I forgot the minimum class. I think it was like six units for open universities. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the public education university system for state schools in California, if you're, you can, if you're a matriculated student, that means working towards a degree, it's a lot cheaper per unit to take a full 12 units and enroll as a student, or like it's, you can treat it like a community college. You can be, a student just to take classes just for your own enrichment, but it's like triple, quadruple the price per unit. So we had guys that were just paying the bare minimum of open university only during the spring semester, just so they can play. But being around those type of guys that just are going to ball all day. That's how, that's how I got better is we, we play them, you know, play at school, play at practice, travel and go to open gym. I mean, it's, it's an addiction. Yeah, whatever touches you can get, honestly. I mean, it's just the way it is. It's, it's, Volleyball is honestly, to me, is one of the best stress relievers I have of all the different routines I have. So, yeah. when in, when in doubt, go play. <laughs> I love the advice. That's good. Yeah, always helps. So, you, you have a unique perspective because you've excelled at both indoor and beach as a player, but more importantly, as a strength and conditioning coach, and I've worked with the top indoor and beach players so what is the difference for you, I guess, the similarities and the differences between training indoor and outdoor um, athletes for strength and conditioning? Yeah, um, man, there, there's so many different, uh, there's so, just so many different physical demands for each sport. Um, there's a lot of considerations that you have to count into. So you know, for any strength coaches or even young athletes out there who are trying to figure out how to write their own workout um, or even how to put something together they can just do on their own. If they, let's say, can't afford a personal trainer, you got to think about, one, what's kind of like 
that work to rest ratio of actual rally time, typically in an indoor game and in a beach game, what's the rest time? Um, let's say for example, like beach. So you're looking at about seven seconds of actual play, typically, you know, of all the film we've watched and about 20 seconds of rest in between points. So refs kind of wiping out on the ball, tossing it over, getting ready. Of course it changes a little bit. Um, the FIVB is, I mean, they're fast. Like these, these refs don't care. It's like here, boom, serve quick. Mm. And then AVP, I mean, you know, a lot of people just play to the crowd. A lot of people kind of hang out with them, on, you know, on the back line and talk a little bit before they serve. So um, it, it, there's there, there's a difference there, but it's a typical seven seconds to 20 seconds there. Mm. Um, and then in general, you know, throughout the year and how you, you plan out for your tournaments. So let's say high school and college is very different because it's, it's very uh, – they, they go by the seasons of the school year, right? But then at the professional level, you're looking at year-round traveling, playing, training. So there's a very different, there was a huge difference there. So um, if we're looking at the the school, right, the school level, so high school and college, you're you're looking at, you know, your fall, your winter, spring, summer. So you want to break off how you train athletes for there. So if you know you're way far off um, from actual play, I mean, you're looking at higher higher volume, lower intensity exercises. Um, in, in reps and set counts, um, you know, through a wide range of movement patterns. So it's a really good time to explore things for their body um, and really work on things they aren't able to work on during season. Because by the time you trickle towards season, you know, you're looking at high intensity and lower volume, right? Mm-hmm. And it's a little bit very more specific to, to that, their sport. So a lot of power movements, whether it's jumping, turning and running, um, producing power throwing. So it kind of really depends uh, where you're at in the season and how you write your programs for those kind of athletes at the school level. Um, and, you know, at the professional level, it's, it's very different because let's say um, at, at the beat with the beach team, right. If, if you're playing competing on the AVP and the FIVB, man, you're, you're traveling a ton. You're on and off of playing a lot already for the AVP, right. And maybe not quite as much because it's one tournament a month or so. But if you're playing in the uh, FIVB, I mean, you could be going 15 straight weeks of being on and off of playing every every five to seven days, maybe every three days. Because sometimes you go out there, you don't make it past the qualifier, right? And you, you waste, you know, you lose all the money, and then you fly back home where you plan your next trip. So um, there's a lot of uh, underlating, right? Underlating periodization with the, the national team, kind of based off what's going on, and you're always on call. So if an athlete is in Spain, right, and they're going out there and they lose sooner than you expected, and then they have a two-week break, let's say, before their next tournament. Well, you you got to either keep it the same or start changing things up to kept, uh, keep them ready for that, or let's say you have four or five weeks where you're not competing. So, and then you can revamp it as well. Mm-hmm. But if you're, you've got athletes who are going from one to another, one tournament to another for – I don't know, six to eight weeks straight, then you got to really make sure that you're moderating and managing what's going on because a lot of them are, are working out on the road. They kind of work out between days of the tournament sometimes, um, sometimes as a recovery, sometimes just to get something in. Um, and a lot of times they don't really have equipment over there anyways. Mm-hmm. So um, that's just kind of a background of what, what you know, viewers and fans of yours can expect of, a, you know, the highest level of strength and conditioning for, I guess the highest level of volleyball, right? You know, you can't get any higher than USA volleyball. So, um, yeah, it's it's a lot of critical thinking of what's going on because if you give an athlete the same amount of stuff you would give um, an athlete who's just prepping for, let's say, a set amount of games for this specific time of the year, like college, to an athlete who's traveling on and off the plane year-round, um, then they might get hurt because mm-hmm. there's just too much. There's too much volume going on. and you know sitting on a plane all day doesn't help either so maybe a day um of your workout is honestly some active recovery maybe or maybe just some a few simple exercises to get them going and um to open things up and get their circulation going so it, it's really hard to dictate those things sometimes because sometimes tournaments do get canceled right so like COVID, that's a huge thing right now for me because um you know, we're planning so much for different FIVB events and per se the world champs, let's say, or the Olympic games coming up. Um, and a lot of strength coaches who are involved, it, it, you know, like there's another guy up in that gym 
uh, Christian, who I'm pretty sure has had to revamp a lot, you know, so uh, if it's pushed to next year or the year after, man, it, that's crazy because there's a four year training period where yeah. we're geared and ready for this. And now it's like, wow, we, we got to redo it, you know, but it's how you look at it too. It's all about perspective, right? So it, to some it's like, dang, we, we spent four years and now we're going to backtrack or what whatnot. And to me, I think it, it's going to be really interesting. Maybe we'll see even higher level volleyball because now they have more time. You know, maybe they felt some of them felt like they ran out of time. Yeah. Um, so that's just like a background. But I mean, with a volleyball athlete, you know, just you're asked a lot. I mean, you're removing so many different movement patterns. And I think volleyball athletes in general are some of the most athletic people around. I mean, um, and so sometimes you got to watch games and see what positions you get into, where they're hitting, they're blocking, they're passing, yeah. um, some awkward positions for digging or running down a ball. Um, so you got to make sure in the off season, you're spending a lot of time uh, helping them allow to get in those positions, right? So some of them have the right mobility or the stability to hold themselves in certain positions. So yeah, off season training is a lot of the very, uh, I guess, um, boring like a style of exercises and not, not very fancy or flashy, but most necessary. So, you know, make sure you're taking care of one, your injuries, um, areas that need most care and areas that you feel most exposed. Um, and those exercises can be endless, you know, it, it's, it's very simple. And, um, but a lot of athletes are, when they do these exercises, they're, they're pouring sweat, they're grimacing, they're grinding it out because they're putting their all into it. Even if you just, at first sight, it looks like the most simple exercise, but they understand that you have to layer a foundational groundwork um, with all these athletes too. You're always teaching them um, from anatomy side, from the exercise physiology side, you're, you're feeding them a ton of information so that they know what they're doing and why they're doing it. Mm -hmm. especially for them, if they have a very specific uh, injury or some sort of dysfunction for their body. So that's, that's why, um, they put so much time and effort at knowing that whatever I'm doing now, season comes, I'm not going to feel whatever pain or what it is I'm trying to get away from. So that early off season block is a lot of that, just uh, a lot of, you know, um, stability, balance, um, maybe even a little hypertrophy at some point, right? Uh, volleyball athletes aren't the biggest, but sometimes you need to build muscle in certain areas, like around the shoulder, right? Around the hips, the glutes, sometimes people are very quad dominant. Maybe, maybe we need to develop the hamstrings and the glutes a little bit more. So, um, and sometimes people have a lot of knee issues um, because, you know, they, they have underdeveloped quads as well. Even though it's overused, it's also underdeveloped because it's not absorbing all these forces that it's taken on. So it's a lot of very, uh, I guess you could say, um, unflashy, very unsexy exercises, right? But like I said, most necessary. And then you, then you start transferring over. We have them start going into more of a basic strength, right? So start off basic strength, a little bit heavier loads on lower volume. And that could turn into um, some eccentric work, right? Some isometrics or even a mixture of two at some point in that training block. Um, but typically you're looking at, you know, the, the basic exercises, you know, stability balance, higher rep counts, muscular endurance, um, and then you move into a little bit more eccentrics, right? So slower pace, slower tempo, um, putting them under time under tension a little bit more to help develop these a little bit more, right? So a little bit more hypertrophy in there, but learn how to be in control and strong through a range of movement patterns. So you're not just going in and out of something. And then you go into a little bit more strength base. So you can blend in the eccentrics and then a lot of isometrics eventually. Um, and then you go away from that and now you're, your tier and between strength and a little bit explosive strength, right? And then um, you you blend it even more as you go. You maintain some of the strength exercises, and then you go into explosive and reactive strength, right? And then when I say explosive and reactive strength, those are more specific terms for power. Mm -hmm. So a lot of athletes, when, or not a lot, a lot of strength coaches, when you go and chat with them um, at, at a very high level, when you start talking about all these things, um, a lot of them refer to refer to explosive strength, reactive strength. Um, instead of power, speed, right? So, because it's, it's, if you think about it, it's, it's very vague, right? It doesn't say a whole lot, like, what are we doing right now? Mm -hmm. but we're, working, we're working on power. Well, what kind of power? I don't, I don't know what you're talking about, right? So, um, and then once you get in the season, I mean, 
but at, at that point, we're not looking to make any more adaptations or any huge growth or jumps and gains. Um, because when these athletes are already going through a lot of stress, they're really sore from playing, um, they're fatigued from traveling, maybe they're not caught up with sleep because they're probably jet lagged going from one country to another to another. Um, and so recovery is down. Um, so that also means their immune system comp is compromised. So, um, yeah, not, not very much a time that you want to start making more gains. There's a lot of um, maintaining what we did in the off season and just holding on to that, right? So we can still perform and excel at a high level without falling off in uh, performance uh, characteristics. Mm -hmm. So that's how we kind of write programs for athletes. And obviously, uh, I'm not giving away specific exercises, but what we do because there's a lot of technology, there's a lot of data and stuff going into that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, but that's just kind of the basic breakdown. And obviously, if anybody has questions or wants advice, then they can obviously reach out to me on Instagram, um, which is at training matrix underscore uh, at training underscore matrix. But um, yeah, that's that's a basic time uh, outline of it all. And like I say, if, it, if we're figuring out that they're traveling a lot certain times and then not so much certain times, you really have to change like what's going to happen. You know, if we have if we have five weeks off from competition, then what, what should, what's really beneficial right now? And yeah. honestly, sometimes if the athletes uh, really irritated with their shoulders or the knees or something, or just, just something going on that's out of the ordinary, then you have to tailor that as well. So, yeah, it's not just like, um, like most people think, like, here's a strength program, like, show me what they do. And it's more like if I do show you, it could change anytime on a given day. Um, it's very, it's very specific to them as a person, very specific to their position, very specific to their body types. So yeah, it's crazy at the highest level. I didn't even know about this stuff until I got into it. Right. I, I used to think like in school, I was just taught, right. Here's this program. This is how you progress. This is how you undulate it. This is how you uh, take, you know, a D load week, or whatever. And it's very basic by the book. Yeah. And I think most researchers, um, therapists, strength coaches at, you know, levels of different sports at a high level can definitely say that it, it's very not black and white anymore once you get into the actual field. And that's, you know, yeah. a lot of research is going out about it. Yeah. Yeah. I think most people, we view periodization as very linear and most amateur athletes, it's very predictable schedule. We have our, our league nights and you know, our, we're not able to exert as much force as these Olympic level athletes. So our injury is going to be significantly less and the volume is going to be less. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say even for the serious athletes, you know, undulating periodization, being able to adapt your program and have goals based on where you're at at that time uh, is, is really critical. And I would say the best problem to have as a trainer is, you know, when the athletes want to push harder, but it's challenging also trying to educate them, like you said, on saying, eh, we don't want to go too close to our one RM this week. You got a tournament coming up next week. Your nervous system is going to be fried. It's like, well, I feel great. It's like, well, you're not going to feel great in six or seven days. It takes a long time to recover, you know, things like yeah. that. So having a, a trainer uh, and, and Chris has a great you know, facility down there. You can work with it in person or you can work with it online but it's really important, even if you just have one conversation or pay for one program, that's education that you're getting for a long time and you're, you're actually preventing a lot of future injuries when you do learn about what's good for you and have someone evaluate your, your mechanics. So that's really important. So yeah, yeah, I'm assuming the periodization model um, of how you're planning the preseason, the hypertrophy, um, the stability work, all this stuff is going to be safe for the indoor athletes. Now, in terms of the training differences, because I know for beach, obviously we have sand that affects the ground contact time. Um, I know there's more, from my experience working with beach athletes, which is limit, much more limited um, than you, so you can definitely provide greater insight. Uh, the approach is more of a gallop because you want to go into the sand and compress it, create a hard surface so you can jump straight up, a little less broad jumping. Um, also, the co-contraction time is longer for beach because you're just having, one, your surfaces are constantly uneven, so it's not everything contracting all at once, right? It's almost like a delayed shift, 
Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of curious, how do you tr adapt to those differences based on the, the, the surfaces like that? Yeah, definitely. That's, that's definitely a huge aspect too. I mean, the ground contact is very different. Um, and I guess, interestingly enough, there's a lot more ground contact and touches uh, and jumping if per se with the indoor game compared to the beach game. So that's another consideration you have to think about too, uh, making sure these athletes, their workload capacity is, is matching the demands of the game, right? So if it's not, and you're not managing the recovery, they're more than likely going to run into some issues um, physically, right? So different injuries. Um, and with the beach game, I think, yeah, the huge thing with, um, with those athletes is, yeah, it's very hard and the co-contraction is a little bit longer for sure. And so in the weight room, a lot of times you're looking at exercises that, um, that forces you to work on, let's say explosive strength, right? So explosive or reactive strength, two different things. So a really easy way instead of explaining it to just have you picture is, um, let's say you have like a hex bar, hex bar uh, squat or a barbell back squat, right? So explosive strength is if I tell you, all right, well, you're going to go down, you're going to get into a squat position, whatever position you like to jump out of or as low as you get on defense. Let's say you hold it for a tempo, hold it for three to five counts, right? After the three or five counts, you jump up, land, reset, all right? Next one, go down, hold for three counts, jump, land, reset. And a reactive is a lot more, all right, start tall, drop and jump right away as fast as you possibly can. So those are, to make it easy for you to understand, those are the two different components there. Um, and a lot of times there, there's a lot of uh, isometric, you know, um, explosive exercises like that in the weight room because it takes into account when you're trying to jump out of these uh, isometric positions, you've taken away the elasticity of these muscles, right? It's going to be uh, um, release as heat at this point. So just like a fun fact for people, when your muscles stretch and contract, the faster you can get in and out of that and go through that cycle, uh, the better. If you take too long at the bottom, then it gets released as heat and your potential to uh, get out of that quickly um, pretty much diminishes. So we, we put those athletes in those positions, right? Whether uh, unilaterally or bilaterally, <clears throat> then force them to get out of it, whether it's up and down, or whether it's uh, side to side, um, or whatever is pertaining to different uh, scenarios in their sport, uh, we think you know we think that that's going to help them uh, prepare for those kind of demands. You know, what's going to happen in the sand, right? I don't I don't think mm, a lot of things in the weight room can mimic the sand, obviously, but those are just some of the things how we can how we can manipulate how the fibers work, right? How the muscles work, um, and what what the sand takes away, which is the a lot of that reactive or elastic component. So we try to do it in the weight room as well. Mm. That's cool. I, I, um, I, I, I learned something there in terms of having greater emphasis of the explosive strength. So uh, pausing at the bottom. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I do, I do see a difference in, because what's visually confusing sometimes is that some beach athletes, and, and what I see just through the eye test, they look leaner. So when mm -hmm. I think of leaner, I think of more elastic, more dependent on elastic energy, but then the sand takes away all that. So there is a greater emphasis on explosive strength. So being able to generate greater force from a standstill position uh, because all the elastic energy is going to be taken away. Whereas if you're on hardwood or sport court, you're just bouncing off the floor using your tendons. Uh, so that's, that's cool. So if, I guess if you're trained for beach, make sure you focus on a lot of a seated box jumps, one of my favorite um, explosive strength exercises to take away elastic and eccentric. Um, so, yeah, same I, here. I, Love the exercise. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. guess another thing I would bring up too is um, looking at the different things that are going on in beach, right? So, let's say you take a blocker, um, there are scenarios where they're delay blocking, right? Mm -hmm. Or if they're diving or leveraging, whatever they're doing, um, they're, sometimes they're waiting down there at that bottom position and then having you get out instead of, you know, indoor years, a big open step, follow up, big swing block. So it, it, the speed of it is, is very, so varied within beach with yeah. how each task is carried out. Uh, that's why we got to make sure that these athletes aren't just one dimensional or two dimensional. They're, they're multidimensional. Yeah. And, um, and then for defenders, I mean, defenders more than those blockers are, 
are going to be placed in the weight room in those isometric positions and trying to get out of that low position because they're playing deep. They're sitting there. They're not moving. They're just sitting and having to sprint for everything. Right. So it's a lot different indoor where you you're, you're designated this spot on the court. You are um, asked to dig these certain balls and there's a driving force of this is your task. This is your role. And that's it. Right. And so, you know, if you're a defender on the beach, the court, the court's all yours, right? If, especially if the blocker doesn't do their job, you're having to, um, you're you're asked to do a lot um, out of a standstill position. So if you, a lot of people start watching film, and they start watching these defenders and how they move, a lot of times you'll notice they're um, they're kind of sitting there, mm-hmm. and they either hop in place or they uh, side shuffle right or they fake whatever they're doing. There's different movements, yeah. and you have to understand too that like. Sometimes they do it to their advantage because it helps them get in and out. They can use a little bit of elasticity yeah. to get out of that. And so just standing still. So that's just a fun fact for people. Obviously, it's game strategy too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I didn't realize that the – for blo- I don't know some beach, there's a lot of blockers <laughs> that just wait at the bottom. And I'm assuming they're trying to get out of the visual box of the hitter to be more mm-hmm. deceptive. Or maybe yep. they don't know what tempo they're going to be setting at, so they have to be loaded but a completely mm-hmm. different blocking technique for, for indoor. I can't imagine how much more glycogen that burns just, I mean, first of all, you're blocking so much more in beach if I'm a single blocking position, right? Oh yeah. So how do you handle that? I mean, just contracting for that long in that bottom position. And these guys are like just above parallel. It's, it's not like a quarter squat, right? It's, it's pure muscle recruitment. So how do you adapt to those, I don't know what to put it. I mean, those glycogen demands. Glycogen demands. You're just holding, flexing for so long. Yeah. So that that goes back to how we prepare for it in the weight room too. Um, <clears throat> so we we got to take into account that we got to put them in these deep positions. So that's why the the off season is so important because we really focus on their ability to hold these positions for a period of time um, and to be able to get out of it effectively. Um, some athletes also can't do that as well. So like, if you look at some of our blockers, um, there's a few guys who only get into a half squat and that's all they can go. Some can only get into a quarter squat and instead they start hinging over and they like touch the ground Mm. because they don't have that mobility and very, very few, I would say can get all the way down. Right. You know what people would say, ask the grass Mm. and be able to get out of it. So, um, so I guess not everybody is able to get there and so they don't have that demand on them Mm. and some people just they just naturally they have that they've played like that their whole life so it's not very hard um and i guess not every single block is like that you could say as well so sometimes it could be a quick block and quick go sometimes Mm. you really load up um it really depends on how that game's going and the tempo of it Mm. i mean if, if that team's on the opposing end is in system a lot then you can have more time to set up and do your thing and gather and play with your strategy uh, that team's a little bit more more crafty. Maybe not passing so well, and the ball's just moved around a lot. You as a blocker just doing a lot of chasing, mm-hmm. and with that chasing, you can't you can't get there quick. Load all the way down and get out. So it really depends on the game. So I guess it's safe to say too. Um, I guess they're lucky that they don't have to get into that position get every single time. Um, but I hope that answers it. Yeah. No, that does. And one another difference I noticed too is um, for hitting wise. I noticed for beach, pretty much the usual straight up and down, but very often being able to land almost two feet at the same time, very consistently, just because the set's going to be more up and down. Whereas the indoor demands, there's a lot more shearing forces on your knee because the tempo and you're, you're trying to time your broad jumping approach at an angle going toward the set while it's going across you. So if you don't get it in time, you're going to have to lean and then your right leg's going to counterbalance. You're going to land and partially rotate just to hit away from your body, just to keep it in. A lot more of that going on. So, how do you adapt your training to, I guess those those type of demands for indoor athletes who have to get into these really awkward positions, hitting wise, landing and jumping. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, it, the biggest thing with indoor athletes for sure, land one their one leg. I mean going to happen right it's Mm -hmm. it's inevitable it's i haven't been able to you know tell athletes every time hey you're going to land on two feet 
every single time you hit and you're going to be pitch perfect. You know, I mean, you're going to be perfect yeah. and crisp. It just doesn't happen. So now a lot of strength coaches have veered away from that and, you know, have really adapted the idea of, all right, well, they're, they're always going to land one leg. Right. So we can't just tell them to not do that. Now we have to train for that. Yeah. So a lot of the, there's a lot of different exercises. Um, maybe starting out, you're doing a lot of different skaters, let's say different holes, landing on that one leg, sticking it, then progressing it from a height, right? And then height and distance. And that could be modified, progress, regress in so many different ways, whether with med balls or different weights, um, with cables, bands. So, and, um, you know, there's even exercises where, uh, let's say I have an athlete, right? We're standing, you're standing right next to me and you're jumping up whatever angle or even straight up, straight down, keeping it basic. And I have, whether it's just my hands or I take like a yoga ball, physio ball, and I give you a hard shove midair, and then you're forced to land with both feet. Reset, same thing. Maybe later, maybe less of a shove as we progress, you land on one feet. So it, it just kind of varies. And then sometimes you can have athletes um, standing on a box, right? You know, drop off landing, drop off landing one leg, doing it laterally. Mm-hmm. And I just, interestingly, I've been doing a little more of um, having them on the box, jumping off, turning 90 degrees, landing, turning 90 degrees, landing, or turning 180 degrees. Um, and eventually progressing that where they would hold a med ball or something heavy that's a lot more forces pulling down and it forces them to hit the brakes harder, right? And being more rigid. So putting them in a lot of different positions and forcing them to land in those positions, whether bilaterally, unilaterally, and just um, giving them a lot more stress on that end so that they're used to those components when it, when it comes to game time. Because before it was just lift, lift, jump, lift, maybe some single leg stuff, single arm stuff, lift, more jumping, maybe some landing, but then it never was really geared toward, all right, now there's this whole other realm of, all right, game-like scenario. How are we going to make sure that when it comes time that we're ready for these very specific things? So yeah. that's kind of how, how we go about it in our thought process. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I do a lot of that with my clients too, uh, depending on their stage development and their position. You know, middles are going to be rarely contorted in their hitting. It's it's a fixed moment. It's a lot of more drifting. Can they handle the push one and the back one from, but luckily for them, it's it's very predictable. Um, outsides, opposites, um, you know, a lot of just weird positions. And I found I, when I first started training, I would stay away for a lot from quad specific training in terms of greater hyper, you know, hypertrophy, just more strength. But mm-hmm. I've, from my experience, I feel like it's benefited my athletes, the eccentric, that how quads can be just such a great decelerator for all of that, right? The, the medialis and lateralis have so much effect in knee stability. And so uh, one thing that's helped for a lot of my clients for with their knee problems is like just sprinting, like do a four step sprint and then slow down and using that as a, a muscle builder or a strength. And then from there, when you're turning, adding a, a squat position at the end to continue to have that decelerating component um, for, for, yeah, I guess just for some of the, the quadrants of emphasis um, I, I used to, hardcore emphasize everything's hip glute user glutes to do control everything and don't touch the quads because they're already getting enough work uh, but that's i guess that's that's why i've been been learning a lot and, and founding some success with mm-hmm. yeah definitely i i think a lot of uh you know with a lot of athletes people in general are uh, hips hamstrings hips hamstrings glutes um and then you know the occasional quads and even you know with any jumping athlete people are are to be quad dominant, right? So, and people know that, so they, they veer away from it. Um, and interesting enough, you know, like a lot of people, I was taught that too a lot of times when I was kind of going through a lot of different internships and obviously learned a lot along the way. Um, and then started attacking the quads actually a little bit more mm-hmm. um, through various different exercises instead, right? Like, especially eccentric, so it's really good. But a lot of things that place less torque on the knee. So, anything from a band resisted terminal knee extension or uh, anything of that nature sometimes honestly putting them on the the quad extension machine Mm -hmm. um, so you can directly attack the quads more than putting pressure onto the joint and sometimes that's the issue it's just that quad is not fully developed and it's just so weak 
yeah. but because they're quad dominant and then those weak muscles can't contract and um, absorb forces very easily and so instead of the muscles taking on and producing those forces that knee joint right the patella tendon is going to take on a lot of that mm -hmm. so that's where a lot of those issues happen um you know i mean even going back to the single leg stuff uh it really comes down to you know sometimes it arches your feet you know like how strong are your feet um because that goes into how stable your ankle is and that trickles up to your knees and it goes to your hips and it goes to your back so it's all chain right like i said it, the off season is very groundwork right building from the yeah. ground up literally so um yeah so that, that's an interesting point that you brought that i think people will find really interesting about uh going away from quads and actually it's it's pretty good if you're going about it right and uh you're, it's pretty planned um there's a lot of really good podcasts about it um on on just fly like they were talking about tendon training yeah. um and tendon training goes with you know if you have knee pains or whatnot and then you're wondering why these therapists or strain coaches are forcing me into like these eccentric rear foot elevated or so-called uh, Bulgarian split squats under time or these uh, single leg heels elevated squats yeah. is because they're attacking those tendons head on instead of always ice and rehab or whatever. They're, they're attacking it, forcing it to grow and adapt in this off season. So once it comes time now, they're actually strong and have, you know, gone through hypertrophy and, well, whatnot. So I think um, it's really important for people to know that, you know, you want to train those tendons and attack it head on, then always trying to mask it, right? Instead of, instead of adding a positive to the negative, you want to actually take away the negative as well. Yeah. yeah. And to add on to that, um, a lot of our quadriceps are active for the listeners out there for the, you know, the quadriceps are in the stress position when here's my thigh, my femur and my tibia. It's stressed here, and we experience knee pain not when our quads are turned uh, extended at the top. A lot of people will feel it on the way down. So doing eccentrics where we're stretching the tissue in this position and to be strong, and the, that stretches the patella the most, right, in this stretched mm -hmm. position. So how do you stress that the most? And the tendons will respond to muscular stress. And that's helped me a lot for my knee recovery. I had a really bad knee injury leading up to nine man. And doing a lot of single leg, leg extensions, which is a controversial exercise. Actually, I would love to talk about that with you after this, um, mm -hmm. but you know, extending up, holding that down and just slowly going down and really stretching it out and holding that. And eccentrics are gonna build so much more muscle tissue, but getting it in those stretch positions. And like you said, being strong through a full range of motion. And when I first started doing that, I actually for, realized how hard it was for me to actually have that neuromuscular connection. I had trouble turning my quads on and I've realized how much my right quad was doing so much of the work, which makes so much more sense. So mm -hmm. doing the single leg work uh, really helps decrease some of that dependency on a dominant leg, which will cause injuries in both, right? One's gonna be overworked, one's gonna be underworked and over time, both are gonna get injured. So that's helped me so much. So I'm curious about your opinion on the leg extension because Half the people say it's terrible, too much force on the knee, and it's not a closed chain work, which is compromising knee stability. And then other people say it's it's my go to knee recovery exercise. Because I so I actually saw an ortho uh, for Kaiser for my knee after nine man. Well, then I went to China, and that really messed it up. It was already bad leading up to. I, I rarely ever take ibuprofen, but we made it to gold round at last year's nine man. I was like, Dad, I can't, I just, I have to play. So I just tucked it out and um, of course I didn't feel it, but you know, afterward it was hard to walk. I was like, shit, I hope I didn't tear anything. Um, but luckily I saw the athletic trainer at my school. She did all the, the non-invasive tests for ACL and MCL. She said, I passed all those. So then I said, okay, I'm going to take, I have to play in China for three weeks. <laughs> so, yeah, dang. and I was like, yeah, I'm already, they, the sponsor have already paid for the trip. So I went, I played through it and it just made it worse, of course. And that's why I came back and I decided to take a month and a half off and finally went to go get scanned. Uh, luckily, no tear there might be, I don't know what the term is, but it's the, it's essentially a small divot possibly in the head of my humerus. So, cause it catches at certain angles 
but they said it was really, it was like a less than a few millimeters and it's only suspected. It's just a little bit, you know, murky there. Uh, so went to go see the physical therapist and she was, I, I wanted to start doing leg extensions, but, and she was the one that confirmed that this is what's, and she's a volleyball player. So she recommended it, but then the ortho recommended against it. But mm -hmm. anecdotally, I've always had so much benefit from leg extensions. Um, but I understand the mechanics of the shearing forces, but you know, but I'll, I'll let you, uh, I'll speak on that. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> You're like yes i want to know for myself yep that's funny is it recording right now yes yeah awesome sorry okay. the refrigerator is making some noise i hope it's not too loud oh no worry you probably just heard me pouring my coffee right now <laughs> <laughs> but um actually this is pretty cool yeah uh i think people would uh appreciate it, it says get after it oh nice <laughs> pretty cool mug but um yeah i for me personally, I, I suffered um, a pretty intense uh, case of Oscar Slaughter's disease, which is like, uh, it sounds terrible, but it's really not. It's really a, uh, it's a very um, deeper stage of, I guess, um, tendonitis, right, in the knee. So, so some tendinopathy, so people with jumpers knees, like, is a pretty common term. <coughs> Like personally for me, I had it pretty bad on my right knee, um, just playing outside hitter kind of like my whole life. I, I mean, it was all throughout maybe second year of honestly high school started mm -hmm. and then junior year started getting a little bit spotty and then senior year, it just got so bad. I mean, sitting hurt, standing up, sitting down hurt, it just throbbed all the time. I couldn't like take a knee, um, driving hurt probably yeah. driving the most um and it what was crazy is uh, if you take a patella and it's like a triangle it was directly on the bottom tip and under like i could put dig my hands in there just i would always try to just grind it out or like push Tense. on it move around just to make it like um i guess just to make it hurt more it was weird because like the more it hurt the better it felt yeah. and i think i didn't understand but uh, you know later on they probably just draw, drew a lot of blood in there, got it inflamed and helped numb it. Um, but it, it was just so bad. And then uh, it just, you know, to me, it just had to come down to just playing so much volleyball, not knowing a whole lot about the body, right? And it's not anybody's fault, you know, all these high school coaches and even college coaches um, in general, like they're not movement specialists, you know, they're not strength coaches. You can't expect them to tell you a whole ton of things in detail from what they only know. So. Um, now I'd say college coaches on have a better knowledge about it because they're surrounded by so many experts, but yeah, it kind of happened in college. And I think that's why a lot of high school athletes deal with that kind of stuff because mm -hmm. they just don't, uh, aren't taught any better. So I had a, a really uh, severe kind of case of that. And it wasn't until I went and played in college um, and our staff that year when we won state was, they're amazing. They're really good staff, um, you know, staff that actually coach uh, guys like TJ DeFalco and like, all their guys when they were in high school, middle school, all the way up to Long Beach. So we had that kind of staff with us. And we had a lot of guys who knew a lot about the body. And so we spent a lot of time warming up, doing a lot of different exercises in the weight room, uh, full on dynamic warm ups, kind of like a national team would, full on cool downs. And obviously going into it from zero to 100 from high school to college, I just, in my head, it was a little bit silly, right? Because I didn't know a whole lot about proper warm up and all that. But I remember catching myself. Um, maybe man halfway through right before uh actual season i felt like i had no more knee pain like whatsoever and um and it, it was strange because it's just a random it, just, it was so natural i remember just kneeling down and doing like a half knee and hip flex stretch yeah and i was kneeling there and then i was just talking to my teammates and then we were talking and i just suddenly stopped talking to them i started looking around like man i am the happiest person in the yeah. world right now and then they just could understand why. And I was like, Geez, you guys don't get it, man. Like my knee, it doesn't hurt at all. Yeah. And like a huge thing to that was like a lot of my own research and stuff at the time when I started getting interested in uh, sports performance, once I started seeing the benefits from what we were doing in the weight room. And uh, a lot of that actually was a ton of mobility. Um, so mobility and flexibility, two different things. I don't know if people know that. 
Um, but actually, for the fans, could you explain? I get that question a lot, but it'll be good to hear from your perspective. Um, difference between flexibility and mobility, real quick. Yeah. So, man. So flexibility, and uh, just keeping it kind of basic, is you know thinking about our muscles, right? Our muscles can contract and lengthen. So it's it, flexibility is a lot more of how well the muscle can lengthen, basically, if you can th put it in that term. So, it, you know, if it's always tight, it's going to give you issues. You know, you can compensate the different other parts of the body. So it, and our body optimally performs and functions when our muscles, um, and, you know, in certain uh, parts of the body that we're trying to get to fire up and go can optimally uh, perform, produce forces if they can stay in a certain range where they can contract and uh, lengthen effectively, right? So if your muscles, let's say in a microscopic level, our muscles are kind of overlap like this, right? Our muscle fibers. So if, you know, you're, you're generally, so this is optimal range, right? And if you're generally pretty tight, these muscles can maybe come together, maybe they're overlapped. So when they do contract, it, they have nowhere else to go, right? So that, let's say that little window is how much uh, it can contract and produce forces, which is not a lot. Right, so we can make if we can make sure that we're in an optimal range, we can have full contraction to produce whatever forces we need, right? And let's say if you're overstretched, there are people that overstretch. Maybe somebody who stretches way too much, does too much yoga. Maybe people who um, mistake in a good warm up with static stretching. So somebody is static stretching before performing, which is long holding stretches. Um, and so let's say uh, a sideline quad stretch, right? So instead of something like a butt kicker or a walking quad stretch, you, you do sideline, hold it for 30 seconds, a minute, two, whatever it is. So what happens is you, you take these fibers and you're lengthening it, right? So they, the, what happens is they actually stay lengthened. You can still contract them, but um, they, they might stay this lengthened for, you know, a good 24. Some studies have shown even up to 48 hours or something like that, right? So if it stays way too uh, lengthened, then what happens is it can only really contract so much right and because that window of contraction is you know only so big um i'm not going to have an exact like what centimeters or how much it can track i don't know that but when it does contract uh, it only goes so much so our optimal range for where producing let's say forces are right here well it can't get to there if it's pre-lengthened way too much right so when you do something like a um a, a butt kicker high knees walking knee hugs you're slightly contracting I mean, you're slightly lengthening and letting it come back, right? So you're kind of just giving it enough of a wake-up call to be like, hey, I'm, I'm about to um, perform, compete, train over right now. I need you to wake up. Um, I'm going to place a little stress on you by stretching you a bit. But I'm not going to do it way too much, right? So then the body's kind of hyped up and ready to go. And that's how you think you take a dynamic warm-up and think in your mind, okay, I'm doing this dynamic warm-up so that my muscles can uh, just slightly lengthen and that I'm creating this environment where it can perform optimally, right? So that's what uh, stretching, right? Just so people kind of have a, I guess, a depiction. Um, and then mobility, it just comes down more to the joint, right? So mobility come, really comes down to how much range do I have at a certain joint or around a certain joint? Um, and a lot of it comes with strength, right? A lot of times you can't get through uh, certain ranges in your mobility because you don't have the strength to do so, right? And then what's interesting too is, you know, they're interconnected. The more flexibility you have in general, uh, the more mobility you have, right? So, but it doesn't also mean that athletes should go and stretch and do a ton of mobility all the time and not uh, develop strength through those ranges. You want to be able to do both. Um, and depending on the sport, like what's more beneficial, mobility or just being a little bit more rigid, right? So like a, like a track athlete. So um, that that's really, I hope that's a clear, pretty easy depiction or description of it. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, and the one thing I'll, I'll add to that is flexibility is a requirement for mobility, but I would say mobility, because you do, your muscles do need to lengthen in certain positions to achieve a range of motion. Uh, but for most people, mobility, you will get sufficient flexibility from good mobility. So that's where I think mobility should be a greater focus because naturally you will do some flexibility. But if you, once, you, once you've achieved good mobility, uh, you, you will retain enough flexibility for your sport, especially for jumpers. You do, do need a little bit of tightness um, to shorten the time that you can contract. Uh, too much flexibility will 
we'll, we'll, we'll in, in pinch that. So thanks for uh, adding some of that. That was great. Yep. I agree. Um, so what back to the, Oh, yeah, knee sense. So, um, I guess a lot of that, obviously I address my knee issues to the coaches and trainers on campus. And, you know, there's always going to be, um, very interesting, uh, information and ways of how people go about rehabbing and strengthening and whatnot. There's, you know, there's never one way to do something. So, um, that's the fun part about learning from different strength coaches, different uh, therapists. And what's interesting too is people have to remember that, um, you know, what works for you doesn't work for everybody. Um, everybody's a little bit different. And like for me specifically, like you, um, uh, I took, you know, the, the seated leg extensions or quad extensions. And I also did it out, outside on my own time at the gym when I would go on my own. Um, and that, you know, that helped for me a ton because I was going away from something that was, let's say a lunge or a squat or not for a little while where I'm putting, um, you know, a lot of tension on my, my knee joint itself, right? The patella. And I'm, I wasn't loading it as I was, I was standing and I was sitting instead. So now uh, I'm taking a lot of stress away from there. And um, to me, it's a lot more, depending how you do it. Let's say if you're just starting out, it's more of just a concentric, you know, mostly a concentric exercise, just bringing up, coming back down to rest, bringing up, coming down to rest. Um, and you can kind of play around with how, um, how hard you want to make it. So at the end, the, the little cushion, you know, if you bring it higher up towards the knee, maybe halfway up your shin, then that's, that's going to be less, less stress on the knee. Right. Cause that, that, uh, that moment arms a little bit shorter. So then, but if, you know, obviously people break down to their ankles naturally, that's when it's going to be tougher. It's further away from the joint to move that thing. Um, but for me specifically, for some reason, for me, my knee didn't uh, bug almost ever. Every time I did that, um, I can definitely feel the patella tendon, you know, um, tensing up and doing the necessary things it needs to do to help me move my leg. But that ten that tension wasn't painful at all. It, was, it, was, it felt like good tension. It felt like everything was contracting and I was able to extend my knee and, or yeah, extend my leg and it didn't bug my knee at all. And it directly hit into my quad. So yeah. actually a lot of our, um, from, from both sides, indoor and beach, um, men's and women's, we actually do a lot of that knee rehabbing and jumpers knee issues with the actual the seated light extension. So we have, that's probably the only machine uh, that we have that we have in the weight room. Right. So uh, we do find a lot, there's a lot of benefit in that where you could sit down, really attack the quads um, without, you know, placing a lot of demands on that joint itself mm -hmm. and just to kind of let that work. And obviously we do a lot of eccentrics with it and try to overload that quad a bit. Um, and so yeah, there's just, for some reason, like for me specifically, it worked a ton. You know, I was, there was a lot of mini band work for my glutes and hip thrusts and RDLs and a ton of mobility. Um, the more I was able to open up my hips, it, it made a world of difference in how, one, I played, two, how much better I moved and jumped, and then three, how much faster I got in four. And my knee, my knee issue is just, um, over time, it almost pretty much just disappeared. And to this day, it doesn't bug me. The only times it bugs me is if I'm coming off from a plane ride or a car ride that was a little bit longer, and then I go and try to play. You know, I have to spend more time dedicated to warming up, getting my joints um, uh, a little bit more loose through just increasing my heart rate, getting blood flow in there, and going through a lot of mobility. And then that opens me up to go and play and perform. Um, and so the moment I don't do that and I just try to go and play, I instantly – like it, it won't feel good. And this, I think it's just always going to be like that. But the fact that it's not hurting all day and especially when I arrive, especially when I play and leave, like to me that I am so grateful for that because for the longest time, I did not know how much more I was going to play volleyball besides passing all day. Yeah. I mean, even, even passing hurt, like taking side, you know, just a shuffle, lunging over, holding myself up. So to me specifically, I, I think the quad extension has its benefits because of those things that I just mentioned mm -hmm. and it worked for me. It sounds like it worked for you. And I know it's worked for a lot of people on the highest levels. And I know a lot of people, it didn't work for a lot of people in the highest levels. And it really depends what's going on with their knee. Like what's going on inside yours is different from mine based yeah. off, you know, some of those diagnoses and some athletes have um, maybe displaced kneecaps a little bit to a certain degree laterally, maybe it's rotated. Right. So, Wherever it is on that knee, it, um, it it does play a huge part 
into whether certain exercises are beneficial beneficial or not because i've seen a lot of very basic exercises be put on um, a lot of high level athletes and so there are some where we just don't do it with it's certain athletes like the most basic exercise we just stay away from completely mm-hmm. and you could look at it and say man well, what's wrong with this person why can't they do this right so it really takes somebody who, who knows them and that they can trust with that information to 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 be able to tr- um, build that rapport and um, just take into consideration of what the athlete needs and doesn't need and how you can get the same stimulus or benefit in another direction so yeah that's my take on it so it honestly comes back to the whole it depends mm-hmm. like honestly that's the that's the best answer for a lot of things so i yeah. hope that helps people and it's it's more of you need to figure it yourself right you need to go and you go and do it see if it feels good if it doesn't feel good as i know a lot of people are talking about like it, it bugs the acl it does all this and that i mean the acl tears and um and just injuries in general are a lot of just extreme hard impact and just torque and torsion of the knee you know changing directions so to me specifically i don't you know the knee the the seated leg extension isn't doing a whole lot of that i would be more worried about how you land and move and yeah. how you play the court than that exercise itself yeah thanks for sharing that that's that's a great insight and in your personal story and there's so many people out there with jumpers knee and, and for you to have such an extreme version uh, that's that's pretty that's great that uh, you've recovered from that and those who have experienced such debilitating knee injuries it's it's it sucks it, it's more than just sucks because you really have to think do I want to keep playing because yeah. this hurts so much you know um, and the good news is majority of the injuries are very very preventable and you can recover the majority of them and to add on to a couple other stories for the leg extension by the way just a disclaimer. You just have to follow what your medical professional says. Um, but I, I personally always try to take it with a grain of salt. And I, I try to consult multiple people of different disciplines to get a full opinion. Because mm-hmm. like my orthopedic surgeon, who also played volleyball, recommended against it. My physical therapist, who played volleyball, recommended against it. My chiropractor recommended it. So I really had to make, an, make like, like Chris said, it depends. I had to make an educated decision. I started off light and said, does this hurt? Do I feel feel knee instability? I know the risk for people who have just loose joints, if you know, the tibia just could just keep slipping out. And if that's you, you don't want to do this. It's, it, that's like the worst thing you could do for the knee with this exercise. Yeah. But as I increased the weight, it actually felt better. So that's how I knew like, maybe this is a good exercise for me. And I actually stayed away from it for a long time because when I was studying for my personal training uh, certification, the accepted dogma at the time was leg extension is bad too much shearing force on the knee. So I just went by that. I just trusted my education in that area until I saw two videos, Holly, Mc, Holly McPeat, McPeak. Um, I think she's only what, five, five? Yeah, she's not very big. <laughs> Bronze Olympic medalist, beach, five, five. That's a major baller. And I was looking, I found a, a training, a, a special of her training and she was doing explosive leg extensions and she was playing for a very long time and then Mm -hmm. second video i saw was the great david lee from usa national team one of the best blockers ever um he was playing for zanit kazan which is one of the top club teams in the world and he just happened to be doing a video on how to help with knee um, injuries and he says in our club we do uh eccentric slow eccentric leg extension single leg and I'm like, mm-hmm. man, one, I, any, any uh, Russian sports team, I believe, usually has a very good strength and conditioning program. Um, so much of our uh, exercise science has been influenced by the Soviet Union, and we still use those principles till today. So they have a very scientific approach to training. So I'm thinking, man, if those guys do it, and you know Zanit's got the top trainers and the top players, and these guys, I mean, David Lee played until late 30s. He's playing the AVP. There's got to be some some uh, merit to this, so that's kind of what opened my mind to, you know. Bottom line is that there's no, very few exercises are bad in itself. I mean, mm-hmm. if you punch yourself in the face, that's not a good exercise, right? <laughs> but very few exercises are bad in itself. Uh, going back to what you said again, it depends. It depends on your body type. It depends on your injury state. 
uh, people who are like Kevin Durant, he's what, seven feet. He's not going to do an ass to grass squat. Just those leverages are just so bad for his body type, right? Uh, where someone like my height, shorter, shorter uh, limbs, I need to get, go all the way down to get full glute quad ham stimulation. Um, so that's going to, I'm sure this this discussion is going to keep going for leg extension. It's going to keep debating. Um, but oh, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And I think, um, here, let's see. I also think, yes, you hear that? Yeah. that <laughs> oh, there's, there's like a cat somewhere in my neighborhood. I can hear it right now. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, it's like, because we have <laughs> three cats here. It's like, I could have swore I put the cats out where they. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. But yeah. I was just going to say, I mean, yeah, if um, if people could just be a fly in the wall in, you know, the USA gym or, you know, any uh, highly successful college scene, um, you know, strength and conditioning facility or room, there's a lot of exercises in there that you would definitely raise your eyebrow to. And there's a ton um, a very old school, you could say, like the quad seated leg extension that people are still sticking to that you could raise your eyebrow to. So it's always a matter of, um, yeah, just, just kind of taking it like, just like when you read research paper, right. There's dozens, millions of research out there. Right. And every time you read it, you, a lot of people, I, I personally think a lot of people shouldn't read it and then take it as, um, okay, like, man, this is what they're finding. This is it. Like, boom, you know, that's it. Like, this is, these are the facts. Um, and I think a lot of young researchers or strength coaches or just people in general who research for fun, just, you have to understand that research has a lot of variables that are taken into account and not taken into account. So um, there's no true answer to a lot of different things. And it's just how you perceive it based off the in information you're getting. Right. So I think that that keeps people open minded for understanding that although the information is really good and this is what they're finding, uh, there, you know, there, there's a lot of different findings. You know, there's people who are going to counter it. So it's kind of up to you to figure out like, all right, like based off what I think, what's best for me, what's the best solution. And, um, yeah, like you're, you're right. And I think, uh, going back to, you know, Russia, they, they've got so many very knowledgeable, um, strength conditioning specialists and movement specialists and, uh, their, you know, their principles and methodologies have carried on through the rest of the world. So if they're hiring somebody over there and they're doing, you know, a lot of different things, then, you know, that, that's, what's working for them. Um, and I don't think uh, they'll very strongly say, this is the best way to do it. This is how that we're doing. They'll, they'll probably say, this is what we've uh, found to be the most effective. And that's why I tell a lot of people, like, I don't know all the answers, uh, right? I don't know every single exercise in the world. I don't know the reason behind every single thing. Um, I know what I know now, and I'm still going to continue to learn and um, feel like, make myself feel like, uh, I guess, you know, not the most, most knowledgeable person in the room, because if I am, I need to get out of that room. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, just, just being like that lifelong learner and figuring it out, you know, I'm pretty, like I said, I'm pretty sure Russians are just saying, this is what's most effective. This is what we found around the world. And, um, <laughs> that's what's going on. Right. And, you know, a lot of times when we're speaking to, you know, coaches from around the country, uh, or traveling out to different seminars or, you know, sometimes when I show up to high schools and talk, um, we talk a lot about in clinics about different ways to let's say pass or different ways to do something in the game that really you would definitely raise your eyebrow at. But when we, you know, show the, the statistics, the facts, and like we're explaining, you know, this is, this is what's happening around the world. This is what's affecting. This is what the most, the best passes in the world are doing. Um, and we're not saying this is the right way, but Hey, like if you're playing at this level, you're doing this, then maybe we should rethink the way we're teaching certain things, you know, as, as you progress in levels. So and I'm pretty sure you can attest to that as you've been around a lot of different athletes starting out, you know, you can teach them very basic things that universal pretty much. And as they get better, you can start implementing a little bit more, uh, very intuitive playing and intuitive uh, movement patterns into their playing style um, that maybe you want to teach right off the bat to a younger person because yeah. they, you don't want them to pick up a bad habit right away. So, yeah, just with anything in general, being an educator, you got to tell people like the people probably listening on this that, um, yeah, figure out what's best for you. Um, there's always going to be a ton of opinions out there. But like you said, seek out, you know, multiple resources, you know, and if they're going to all say the same thing, then maybe go with that. If you're getting conflicted, 
then uh, either seek out more or try everything that both sides are saying and see what, you know, where, where you're at in a couple weeks or whatever it is from then and see how you feel. And then, uh, yeah, that's just, that's always going to be my take on it. Um, what's best for you is only, you know. Yeah. And it also goes back to being developing yourself as a critical thinker and doesn't mean you have to have a PhD or read a ton of research all the time, but be mm -hmm. reflective in your own process and your own development. I think a lot of times we want to look at research for an answer, but it's really just insight. And that's really what research scientists are trying to do. They're trying to gain further insight. They, they know that there are no, I mean, if you talk to a lot of hardcore scientists, they don't like the word facts. They don't like absolute truths because they know it's going to change over time. I mean, for such a long time, we thought that the world was a, a square or the world was flat, right? Galileo was in prison for think, uh, trying to prove that the, the world was, was a, a sphere. Yeah. So it's, it's about gaining insight and then making a decision, an educated decision for yourself and then being open to change and, and surrounding yourself with that. Mm -hmm. As a, to add on to kind of the, the list of the no-go exercises, uh, behind the neck presses. So old school bodybuilder exercise, which what's really cool about some of the old school bodybuilders back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you talk about the most intuitive training group where to them it was all about results. And if they felt it and if they felt good, they kept doing it. Um, so back behind the neck uh, shoulder press was something they did a lot in Arnold's day. But then a lot of people recommend against it because it, if it's, you know, you got maybe you got to internally rotate your shoulders while under loaded position. And it wasn't until I started getting into weightlifting, Olympic lifts and clean jerks. And I saw these elite athletes behind neck pressing in a squatted position, a sauce press or something with mm -hmm. like 150 pounds and their shoulder mobility is crazy and their shoulder health is amazing. And when I had shoulder problems, I actually started incorporating that into my routine because it forces you to not only retract your scapula, scapula, but depress the bottom as well, which is a really good position. And then to place that healthy position under load really helped my shoulders. So that was another exercise that I was told it was terrible, but I ended up doing it because I saw some high level athletes do it. Yep. Yep. No, I agree. I, um, yeah, I mean, especially in school, school is a lot of black and white, like, you do this, you don't do this. This is how you coach and train and talk to your clients or athletes. And this is how you don't talk to them or certain things you say. And I just think um, if you're going to build, you know, long-term lifelong relationships with your people, right? I wouldn't even call them clients or athletes or your people. Then what you read and learn in school isn't really rel you know, relevant anymore. Yeah. Uh, you can't be robotic and not expect to talk to them like normal. Like, how was your day? Like, tell me about your, kids like so, you know yeah. so a lot of the stuff in school interestingly didn't want you to do it they didn't want you to build these certain relationships with your clients is what they were taught in the books because they want to keep it separate of professional mm -hmm. and I to me as a coach like you're always going to build a relationship with your clients and your people and your athletes so um and that you know and I think going back to and that also goes back to the black and white of before um you know you can't do certain exercises so like the behind the back uh presses and you know i didn't know the clear understanding behind it of the why and why not too much and but i can imagine it right the positions it puts people in and then came into the usa facility and uh you know after a couple of training blocks training periods about a year started seeing uh some of it some of the athletes doing it or in the programs that were when i was first coming in and i was like man it's crazy because this is the highest level, you know, like it's yeah. insane. I can't, I can't believe like, it's, are they doing it right? And I even, I asked and then, Oh, it's fine. And we talked about it and you know, it is true. I think if people have the mobility to get back there and it, if it helps in that um, direction, then I think uh, it could be pretty beneficial. Um, definitely like in your case. So I see the benefits in it. And then I also see the, the controversy. So like, again, like the see the leg extension. Yeah. Yeah. And some people's body types won't allow for that position. I oh, think yeah. it'd be really hard for like very short torsoed, uh, 
small scapula, like very low mobility. Um, I think it'd be hard for them. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a huge thing, I think everybody should understand too, that because, because it's such a staple in volleyball players workouts, squatting, you know, and not everybody squats the same. So I hope people understand and realize that mm-hmm. not everybody has to set up the same. Not everybody has to set up their feet pointing straight forward or whatever it is. Right. So I, I just, I hope people understand that it all depends on your body type and your levers and how you're anatomically structured. Right. You could have short legs with a long torso, or you could have short tibia, long femurs, long torso, and you're probably falling back a lot. And unless you change uh, how you set up your feet. So, uh, you, people just really explore, right? Set up in different positions. How how wide do you want to get? How much you want to turn your toes out? Or so it, everybody just has to explore that and make sure that's best for them. Um, yeah. So it just comes down to what what you can get into based on one um, your lovers, lovers as in lengths of your bones, um, and then two your mobility too, right? Like sometimes you can't get into it. Um, and if you guys want to see a very interesting squat, go look at lebron james's squat guys like his squat is like if, if you were just a meathead or just showing up at the gym like you gotta do this you gotta squat all the way down feet point, then like you would look at lebron and just think man this guy is doing it all wrong he has the most atrocious looking squat but that's what works for him i mean he's like his feet are really wide out toes turned out his squat is, he's going down maybe like two feet uh, it, it just looks really strange, but that's what works for him. So, and I have a girl um, the, doing track at BYU right now, and um, she squats actually with her feet completely together. And yeah. She can go straight down, straight up, and she looks perfect. Her back is nice and flat. She doesn't lose balance whatsoever. She's extremely comfortable. And it was weird because I looked at her and I said, man, you squat with your feet completely together. And she's just like, wait nobody else does that <laughs> like she, she looked at me and thought i was weird so yeah it, it was really funny because that's impressive you know not because she just had perfect uh symmetry and all her bone like lovers so she's able to be like compact and do that yeah. so it's just funny that she she thought that we were crazy that we didn't yeah. squat like <laughs> yeah does she have really narrow hips and uh short femur uh yeah her femur and her tibia are like pretty similar length um okay. her torso's decently i have relatively long but even and yeah her hips are pretty narrow her shoulder mobility is great so she just looks like she's holding it right back here and she's just like sitting down she's nice and tall standing up and it was pretty crazy for me to see that and she said her (laughs) strength coaches at byu were freaking out too when they saw her do it (laughs) yeah it was fun Uh one of the guys with the best quads ever, Tom Platt's bodybuilder, was a narrow stance squatter. And you should look wow. him up. He's got monster quads, but he squatted narrow stance as a bodybuilder. Um, wow. But yeah, that would that would probably yeah. scare a lot of the squat police out there on the internet. Um, yeah. Not, not going ass to grass. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. For sure. You know, what I did notice with actually more of my female clients is – I, I'm curious what the ball and joint looks like at the the head of the femur where it attaches to, I'm oh, sorry, the head of the yeah, femur bone where it attaches to the pelvis. I noticed that the ones I've worked with have to open up a little bit more. So not only wider stance, even though they are more mobile, um, they I feel like I have to have them actually rotate their knees more, get their toes pointed out just to get comfortably in a bottom bottom position compared to my male athletes. So I wonder if it's the, the width of their hips. Um, so I'm curious what your, what your observation has been with the squat difference between male and female um, athletes that you've worked with. Hmm. So for me, I think uh, I've, I've seen most of it. I haven't seen it as um, like their hips, like how wide and how uh, narrow they are. I actually see it as more, the first thing I look at is actually their, their femur and um, their torso. So, mm-hmm. man, I wish – I'm actually going to get a whiteboard in my house so I can start, like, writing and teaching things on Instagram. Oh, heck but, yeah. Uh, so just, like, drawing out body levers. So, yeah. man, let's say – I don't have anything around me right now. But so let's say somebody that has a femur uh, – femur here. 
right? And let's say it's really long, like this long. And their tibia is maybe this length, right? And their torso is just about right here. So if you th really think about something that has this long of a femur in their bodies back here, let's say if I do this. So when they go hold weight on their back, whatever, that's a lot of weight, one, with their body being centered back there and then weight on them. So naturally, if they're just squatting with their feet, about hip width apart, shoulder width apart, they're, they're probably going to fall back, right? And so people start thinking, okay, well, maybe they need to elevate their heels or maybe this, they don't have hip mobility. And then I've seen athletes like that who have great, great hip mobility. So it's not the hip mobility issue. So it really comes down to how can I take advantage of this long, oh, it's perfect, of this long femur, right? And make it shorter. So what happens is you can turn your legs out because now look, mm. it gets shorter. So if yeah. this was my hip joint, so it's really, it gets shorter and now I'm a little, I would be a little more upright to go through those squats. So mm -hmm. I would inch it out. You know, I wouldn't tell people to go really wide because if they go really wide, it just uh, compromises the squat just a little bit. But um, yeah, I always look at their, their torso and their femur and how, how long they are compared to the rest of their body or relatively. So really, I mean, I don't just look at that. I look at all of that in general um, and see how well we can just manipulate to make it a little bit better. Yeah. So, but I, I do think there's probably some, uh, a really good benefit in everybody looking into different position setups for hip widths too. Right? I haven't looked too much into that, but for me specifically, that's what I've looked at. Like, how can I manipulate so that I'm making sure our center of mass stays right in the middle where it needs to be. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, there's always other different instances like shorter femurs, long torso, whatever. So they have to go low bar. So it, it just really depends. Everyone's a little bit different in that sense, but that's how I've kind of seen it and made changes. If I saw, uh, recognize something. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense to kind of get the bar back over the center of gravity. And actually just thinking about one athlete I've worked with in particular, what well, one test that I like to do is I have them lie on the back and I have them push against my chest just for some light resistance at different angles. And some people you know, like, Impingement can be looked at two ways. One is mechanical impingement, where the joints are just physically being pinched, sharp pain that's being, you know, the, the path is being closed, or just a structural impingement where maybe the groove due to scar tissue or just you're born that way, it can't move in a certain way. So, how do we open things up so it can get and can slide easily? And so, two athletes, one had a wider stance because. When we went narrow, we just physically, even if I try to push on it, do like a, an active stretch with her, it just wouldn't move, right? If it, if it was tightness, I can move it with assistance. Another one with the, what you're thinking of, uh, I think I, she does have a, she must have a longer femur then because when she does her full approach, her ground contact, contact time is a lot longer. So I'm thinking if you have a shorter tibia, a longer femur, you probably have a shorter Achilles. Um, less elastic ability, more ground contact time, more of a strength jumper, and she's super strong. We can load heavy weights. Um, so actually, for her, that's probably why it worked better for her is longer femur, get her out more, center her. That makes she sense. a pretty good jumper? Um, not naturally. It's it's required. She's responded a lot more to strength. There, we went. We tested two phases. One was more reactive because she's a little bit thicker body type like she, her ankles and wrists are a little bit thicker so my usually response is like, okay get them faster if they're she can handle heavy loads but she just got faster but it wasn't translating to high vertical so we went back to more strength work um and s ironically slowed down her movements just a little bit so she can get into a deeper position and utilize more hip extension and some some jumping mechanics that she actually, we actually got better results that way. Um, but I wonder if it's because the longer femur, shorter tibia, um, it's, it just, yeah, you're just, you're just going to naturally be the time it takes to extend with a longer femur is going to be so much longer. Um, for those, like, if you look at so many of the basketball players, they have that short calf muscle, but if you look at the length of the tibia, it's, it's super long. So that's why they don't need to bend down as much and then they can just pop up, right? Yep. They have yeah. so much elastic energy in that Achilles. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, with the girl with the long femur, you know, that also means more impulse. You know, she has more time to develop. 
power or mm-hmm. strength. So mm-hmm. that's always, I think that was always a little bit harder too. Some athletes, like if they're, their femur or whatever, you know, is longer than it's always a little bit tricky to figure out what's best for them, what's going to work for them. So, yeah. yeah, so I can understand what you mean by that. I've definitely had some athletes in that sense. Uh, and we, you know, we saw a lot of uh, results with it too. Um, and a lot of it too is it, athletes out there, um, they have to understand that, um, you know, you have to learn how to load before you can explode. So like mm-hmm. if, if you're really strong coming out of a position, um, it, it's not a whole lot of benefit unless you're also really strong going, being able to tell your body to go down fast and hit the brakes. Because the better you can hit the brakes and get out, then, you know, the more power that you, that you can develop, um, the more springy you can become. So, um, you know, otherwise you're just kind of like this runaway train that doesn't know how to hit the brakes. So um, that's a huge thing, too. If some athletes out there looking to jump higher, they need to learn how to load before they explode. They need to figure out how they can be stable, be extent- be strong through, a, you know, eccentric training and then be able to get out because a lot of times athletes will – you know, blockers, especially say on the beach, what I'm seeing sometimes um, with our even our best blockers, our best women and men, that they, um, um, they especially college athletes that when they drop down low and get out, the ones that want to drop, the ones that can drop, hit the brakes and get out, you can tell. You can tell just by looking at them. The ones that can't quite, they start dropping, and you see their knees kind of not even buckle, just kind of shake a little bit, mm-hmm. and they take a little bit longer time to get out. And it looks like when they start to try to hit the brake and get out, you can see the brake happening and then they still drop a little bit, their hips mm-hmm. drop a little, and then they get out. Yeah. So what that says is eccentric. They're, they're not quite there yet, but can you imagine if they were able to just boom, stop and get out? Like that's what we're looking for. So yeah. just another thing there. Um, <laughs> we're going off in tangents. I was going to say something else. Um, yeah, just kind of throwing information out there for viewers, you know, like uh, yeah. with the time we have. But yeah, I think that's a huge thing too. So yeah, I mean, back to squats. I forgot what we were talking about. <laughs> yeah. yeah, actually, that's the two most common questions I get whenever we do squats, right? And, uh, the, the common gym motto is don't let your knees go past your toes. And majority of the time, I actually feel like most of my athletes need to do that because one, it's to keep the torso upright, most people are going to have to let their knees go past those, even on a back squat, not even just on a front squat, load the quads a little bit more. And then they go, is it, I thought you're supposed to never let your knees go past your toes. I was like, yeah, in specific body types, but yours is not the one. And I try to explain, like I said, educate the the client. So they have greater volume and understand, okay, this, this is not going to hurt me. Second question I always get is most people are going to, especially young athletes that are still learning their bodies are only going to go down a couple of inches when they do a standing jump. And I'm telling them, and I try to train them to go a little bit lower to get more muscle activation because there's no momentum. There's no speed component. It's all muscular. It's all uh, just force generated from standing position. And then when they first do it, they always jump lower because they cannot isometrically contract at the right angle to stop it and then rebound off. They go low and then they go down that delay and the mm-hmm. delay usually happens with like a weird, there's like a delayed arm swing because their body knows that. So they squat down and then that second drop, that's when they bring their arms down and then they go up and they all say, oh, I'm jumping lower. It's like, you know, this, this is what we want to get. This is the range of motion we want to achieve. Now let's strengthen it from that position. And I guarantee you next month we're going to be jumping two inches higher. If you just trust the process and trust the, the range of motion. Yep, exactly. So just getting strong through a wide range of motion. Um, I mean, a lot, a lot of people will go their whole lives not ever seeing a force plate, seeing what it looks like. Um, but you know, all, all, pretty much all across professional sports, for sure, in the volleyball world. Obviously, I've been around in the USA gym. Um, you know, when you're you're having some of these force plates and you have them to jump, let's say like a counter movement jump. So mm-hmm. hands on the waist, standing tall. Okay, three, two, one, boom. They drop down and jump straight up. So you see this little line that, let's say, if nothing's happened, it's just a straight line, right, on the screen. So when they drop, um, you can see a little dip, right, in force because it's reading that there's uh, not a whole lot of body weight right there going on. And then the moment you hit the brakes, you see a lot of force come up, right? The higher the force and, um, and how narrow this little peak is, it really tells you 
how one how hard they hit it so high it goes then how fast they hit it and got you know got out which is a little uh just that little window i would have to sh draw it out sometime and then once they start jumping um you'll see a little spike right in the concentric phase and actually you see a dip and then a second spike mm -hmm. so that first spike is pretty much that that bottom end portion right that that when they're really getting out of that position so that's why it's really important to develop strength and power through uh, a wide range right like you say like maybe they're in that bottom position they aren't really fast out of it because they refuse to get that low let's say or try to work that uh, range in the weight room over time and that second portion is to I mean when we're most mechanically advantageous to to be at our, our let's say top end speed or be the most explosive or fast out of it like during that quarter squat phase mm -hmm. so that's that second one that goes even higher but the, the thing about um the the quarter squat and on until you're fully extended you're you're producing forces the quickest right so it, it's going really fast at the end the bottom portion maybe not as fast but you're producing the most force mm -hmm. at that bottom position so right so it's how much force you can produce in a short window of time so if you think about that bottom portion is really important to, because that's the kickstart right so it's really important for athletes to understand that there's there's two there's gonna be two little uh dips in that little graph where you're looking at a force plate when people are jumping so just kind of a fun fact there yeah that makes sense uh, I, I like to use anime analogies for some of my younger younger uh athletes where i don't know naruto whatever the with the most recent one that people are watching it's that special move where you kind of jump really hard against the wall and they load and they charge so that they can spring off <laughs> if that yeah. wall is not stable and that's my ability to I, that's why isometrics like a really good exercise you get the home for the listeners even you could do with weight I, body weight's always a good start you squat down as quickly as you can and stop on a dime hold it for three seconds and then stand up you know, doing that with weight, right? Increasing the acceleration or the force of the acceleration. If that wall is not solid, they, they cannot push off as hard, right? If they go here as marshmallow, then they're just gonna keep going past and there's no rebound force in that effect. Yeah. So you gotta be like, gotta be like Goku or Naruto, whoever you guys listen to. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That's funny. That's a, that's a really good depiction. Like I can just, I can just picture all that, which is really funny. Yeah. And yeah. unfortunately, now they have a volleyball anime, so there's no, there's no like magical analogy. You just see it <laughs> on the court. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which is really cool. A lot of people are into that. Mm -hmm. It's pretty awesome. Have you watched, have you watched uh, Haiku yet? I've watched uh, a few like uh, clips more than episodes of anything because we were just like sending it over. Or... Yeah. It it honestly looks pretty good. Like yeah. The the volleyball that's happening in there and everything that's going on. I've seen more, I've seen a, like a lot of clips and more enough of the longer, really long rallies from certain uh -huh. games to just kind of understand that, man, the person writing this and telling them what they want to see in these animations or what's going on really has played, <laughs> you know, like yeah. you can see it and it looks pretty good. I actually like it. I enjoy it. Yeah. I've yet to, uh, <laughs> I've yet to watch it. I need to watch it. Um, I know, it's, on, uh, yeah. it's on Netflix now, apparently. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. I was just rolling around the other day, um, and my cousin who does watch it, he watches it and reads it. Um, okay. But he's like, dude, it's on Netflix now. You can watch it. And then he's, nice. I mean, I, I don't really watch anime at all. I've seen maybe one or two full-on, like, shows, like two or three. Um, and I only watch them because they're apparently really good, and they turned yeah. out great. Um, and others I just won't watch unless people highly recommend it. And I always trust his judgment. So he's like, man, all the MAs I could ever recommend anybody, even if they don't play volleyball, um, what, you have to watch it. Because it's interesting that that show alone is getting people to start playing volleyball. That is nuts. I know. Yeah. So I think uh, it's pretty cool in that sense. And it, it seems entertaining. It seems cool. And, you know, I've seen a lot of other – people trying to portray volleyball in different movies or shows or animations. It's not great, but definitely this one, I could, I could see uh, me dabbling in it at some point if I'm really bored. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's, 
the few clips I've seen too, I'm like this, these, not only the moves, but the way the anime, cause I, I'm an artist. So I, I appreciate the actual animation. Like the movement mechanics are so spot on. And the funny thing is you watch the Japanese national team. I don't know which came first haiku. <laughs> and then they modeled it after that or they modeled haiku after that. But they, you know, the Japanese men's national team has very unique mechanics and they're, they're a cookie cutter. They, it's a slight arch in the back. It's still a lot of torque. But it's elbow below the shoulder, relaxed, left arm really high, mm -hmm. uh, feet together for the count and balance back swing of the legs. And they all look like that. Um, uh, Nashida, Ishikawa, uh, all those guys, except for the middles for the high ball hitters. Yeah. Actually, we should, maybe we can, there's a bunch of other questions, but I'm sure we are having all these, these fun mm -hmm. tangents. Speaking yeah. on, um, spiking mechanics because japan I'm, I'm trying to think of I'll, i guess i'll choose the three most unique spiking mechanics japan one for sure um then we I was, have i have a was feeling I, I have a feeling i know one of the people you're gonna bring up <laughs> okay try to think of someone else that's also unique uh, okay matt anderson He's got, like, I would say him and Clay Stanley have a little bit of a loop. And mm -hmm. they do kick their legs back, but they're actually more spread out. And I'm assuming it's because they bring their elbows out. So your body has to compensate for that, that lateral rotation. Whereas Japan, they go up. So they're more on a single plane, body folding back. And then, of course, we got to bring in uh, Brazil in this conversation, the hardest and the fastest hitters. Also, the most diverse in their hitting mechanics, uh, Lucarelli. Lucarelli, no, Wallace. That's the other, that's the unique oh, one. Yeah. Wallace, the, the, op, the six four monster uh, opposite. So, kind of curious what your take is on that variety of uh, hitting mechanics. Yeah, man, it's always really fun to watch and break those things down for sure. Um, I think Matt Anderson was the one that I was going to bring up. Um, to me, Matt Anderson, uh, his hitting mechanics is just phenomenal. I think he's got one of the most best picture perfect uh, hitting mechanics. Um, along, you know, there's tons of people with great hitting mechanics. You know, he's just, he's just an example because we brought him up. But in my mind, the moment I think of hitting mechanics, I honestly do think, boom, Matt Anderson, pretty, mm -hmm. pretty fast. Um, and he just pops up uh, in guys like Jiba, right? So, I think it really depends on what works kind of best for you. Like Japan's a little bit smaller. They're a little more compact guys and they got to produce forces quickly with whatever space they have. So I, I just think that just like in general, let's say even sprinting, right? So your, your arms and your legs are always going to kind of match and mimic each other. So just kind of the bigger, the more space you take, right? your legs will kind of do the same thing. So like, let's say that's a Matt Anderson or some of the bigger hitters. Um, and then with the small guys, you know, they're a little more like compact, bring it close, nice and high. I think your, their legs are falling as well. You know, there's just, just off of my thoughts of knowing how like the body likes to work in conjunction with each other. Right. Cause imagine if their legs are just huge and they stay like compact right here, right. With uh, Japan, that would just mm -hmm. look really strange. So I think it just depends like what's working them. Cause there's, I mean, some of those guys have really long limbs. So yeah. There is using to your advantage to take a lot of space. And Matt Anderson, um, he's kind of more, he just swings, goes, and he continues that arm swing the whole time. And it just never stops. It's really smooth. And I think it's because he's just producing force the entire time. He's keeping that momentum. He has a lot more impulse as he comes around so that when he does finally get contact on the ball, one, his timing's great. He's always full extended. That thing's so hard to stop. And so by the time he does unload on that thing, that arm's been moving that whole time, you know, and some guys, they go up and there's just, there's a pause and then they go, there's a pause and then they go. So some of the goes, those are the same guys with a lot of tapes all over the shoulders. Mm. So, uh, cause there's a lot of stoppage go and there's just mm. a little, a lot of shearing forces, but I think guys like Matt, um, and who else? Uh, well, I mean, Wallace has a pretty good demo of it too. And guys like, uh, how do you say Zysef? Is that how you say his name? Zy Ivan Zysef. Yeah. Yeah, so his is pretty similar too. Um, that's kind of like my take on it. I mean, guys like Taylor Sander, you know, has a lot of like he comes up and he stops and he goes. Comes up, stops and he goes. 
So, and you know, he's, I know um, just some of those people and beach players too. There's some guys with really great hitting mechanics um, and you can kind of see benefits of it too. And I think it changed, it, it really goes to show like how well they selling certain things too. Like some guys are very predictable, some guys aren't, you know, and that's yeah. just, uh, and how they're going to approach the game and how to set up their hitting mechanics. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of me on it. It really, they all different, very differently because of their body, um, how much space they take in general, you know, mm -hmm. in, in the air and uh, what's best use for them. Cause I think guys with the smaller, uh, let's say the shorter arms, they aren't going to go full on whip, take all this space and come through. They got to more, keep it nice and short and quick, you know, go right through your ball. Right. And so I think that's mm -hmm. how some of those Japanese guys are just so powerful and so strong. Right. They know how to use their body um, going to each of those swings. Um, but all of them, I mean, leading with the hips, you know, coming through the shoulder, you know, a little elbow delay coming around, making sure they're a little offset coming through, hugging the body as they come through. Those are some of the huge things going through, uh, you know, like, I'm not going to say perfect, but like proper and advantageous, efficient arm swing mechanics, the one produce a lot of power, a lot of good results, and also keep the shoulder healthy in the long run, especially their back, because um, yeah. it takes away them having to extend and I'm pretty sure we could have a whole nother video thing about this, you know, about swinging mechanics. Um, yeah. But obviously, I, I just try to compact it for the fans just in case we have more questions. But that's just my thought process about it. Um, yeah, that's just how it – sometimes I spend, like, a quarter to half a whole private lesson. Like, I do private lessons for beach and indoor, too. And um, a lot of it's just on purely mechanics. Like, there's a different little med balls and stuff that I like to use and then see what works best for them. Like if they had like a one or two pound med ball down under their knee, learn to rotate with the hips, come through elbow delay coming around because that ball is a little heavier. Mm -hmm. so really to teach them that movement. Um, and as we go and we translate, all right, let's go hit, let's go down, but whatever it is. And we start seeing, all right, do I need to bring the elbow down? Do I need to bring it high up by here? Do I need to bring mm -hmm. it back? So everyone's just a little bit different. And that's the fun part of figuring it out. Yeah. I, one thing that you we brought up a great point is that everyone's mechanics looks different. And we touched upon this so many times before because your physiology is so different. Also play styles are different. I mean, faster offenses, you have to mm -hmm. approach differently, high ball offenses and so on. But the principles are still the same torque, you know, initiating with your opposing left oblique rotating, and then following through with your shoulder and then going across your body or toward your body at least so that you're closing to yourself and really not getting too much external rotation in your shoulder. Um, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. internal rotation of the shoulder so that they all look different. So that's really cool that you, you still identified all those mechanics and all those. One thing I, I learned that you just, from you, you just talked about, I didn't, I never viewed the loop as a continuation of momentum as a way of your body trying to self-organize to prevent injury, but now I have to do a hard stop and then go, so that's, that's really cool. I, I think that's a really cool way of looking at it. And I, something I, I just thought of to add on to that too is bigger body types are going to do that. They're, it takes time for them to unwind. So it doesn't make sense for them to decelerate and then have to accelerate, especially with that much force and those long of limbs. Clay Stanley comes to mind. Uh, he <laughs> He's not going to stop that big bicep of his. <laughs> it's just going to go down and then boom. Yeah, and, he's got a whole windmill going. And what's really special, I think what's really special is when you f have big guys who play like small guys. Uh, Gregory Grozer, I don't know if you know who that is from. He's he's from Germany, but he plays in Russia. He's he's the guy that will facial people on his jump serve. It there's this you got there's a really cool video of him. He hits so hard. I would say it's Clay Stanley's body type with the almost the explosion explosiveness of Jiba. So the speed with that, all that force, it's really weird to watch. Yeah. And then you, you see the slow motion and the ball, even with a full follow through, the ball is only rotating like two times before it gets on you. And it's not that he's hitting flat. Like he's really trying to hook on top of it. Yeah. But yeah, that will be fun. We should do a, a, a video, another, part where we look at one clip and we kind of give our perspective on their hand mechanics and like what's effective and what's what's uh what we were extrapolating from that 
Yeah, we should. I would that'll be, be fun. That'd be fun. Yeah, <laughs> I got to check out that jump serving video. I mean, I live and die by the jump serve. I mean, I, I yeah. remember in high school or college, I spent like eight hours in the gym uh -huh. just jump serving. My arm was so swollen. I love it. It's like <laughs> getting that toss perfect, tossing from different parts of the court, and actually tossing with different spins on the ball mm -hmm. was able to get me to translate and get that ball to go different directions and really uh -huh. make that passer kind of figure out, I'm like, what's he doing? Like, why is he yeah. tossing like that? So I remember spending like eight to 10 hours on weekends after practice, like Saturday morning practices, just my arm was swollen. <laughs> and I just was just so fascinated. And eventually that led to, you know, I, it, I jump serve that I take a lot of pride in. Um, and eventually that turned to like a lot of hybrid serves and stuff. And it just like, just the, just watching great jump servers is huge. Yeah. Like I think, Jump serving, you know, if it's just straight on, it's really easy to pass. But the moment yeah. somebody can take the spin off of it and get it to move around and put put a little hybrid taste on it, I think, man, those are some of the hardest serves to pull off one. Yeah. But it's even worse for the passer. I mean, it's really hard to to get those yeah. things off. So yeah. I would love to. I need to check him out for sure. Gregory Grozer, yeah. And Matt Anderson, another, his, his, uh, so he serves from area one and he serves his down the line serve is so nasty. Oh, it's yeah. just, a, he's like in that one, he starts in that one six seam and just a little bit cut mm -hmm. away from his body and his yep. landing mechanics are really good. Yep. The way he decelerates, cause he's a, he's a huge broad jumper mm -hmm. and he takes like three to four steps into his, his landing. He doesn't do a hard stop. But if you want to look at someone who knows how to decelerate their body, you know, in a very, and I've seen that evolve over the years. Like he's somebody that I think is very, very thoughtful about his development. And he's, he is who, where, when he started, some people just look like a buffer version, but are doing the exact same over 10 years. He not only got more muscular, but he's like evolved his mechanics and his play style over the years. Yeah. 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 He's yeah. a, he's a pretty, pretty awesome specimen, honestly, to watch. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, so unfortunately, we're running a lot of time. I got to probably do some errands with my great grandma and my wife. But I want to end on, since this is the dig, um, everyone has their underdog story. And that's kind of the theme of Elevate Yourself to Inspire. And whether or not you're a top dog or an underdog, when you have that underdog mentality, you're going to achieve greater than you thought. So yeah. if you want to share an underdog story or experience or philosophy with us, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Oh, man. Where do I start? Um, actually, I go around to high schools um, as a motivational speaker and tell about my story a little bit. Um, not even about my job, but uh, uh, so basically, I mean, it, the stuff I'm doing now is, I, mean, I I love it. I mean, training athletes, highest level volleyball. You know, playing all the top countries in the world, world champs. Hope you know potentially teams in the Olympics, and then now coaching college. Um, actually, I didn't mention it earlier, but part of like the this ABCA group I guess you can call it like a director or board of governors whatever you may call it um to potentially start men's beach in the NCAA mm -hmm. and that's like a huge thing and project I'm working on right now we're doing monthly meetings um and the guy with our group is uh Tom Pestalesi who started women's beach in the U.S. Yeah. so he's on our group so I think that's a good guy you know to get behind because he did it when women's beach was was a thing where people were like, why would we have women's beach, mm -hmm. right? And now look at it. So um, that and just like helping run a strength conditioning facility and reaching athletes, I think, um, you know, it sounds awesome, right? People think it's fun. It must be glamorous or whatever. It's your passion, it's your sport. Like, yes, it's really cool. I, I like it a lot. I'm grateful for it. Um, but, you know, it wasn't always that way. Um, you know, if I had to backtrack, um, I mean, if I asked myself or told myself that I was going to do this now, or what I'm doing now, I would not believe it for sure. You know, just like any other story. Um, it, you know, it took a lot of hard work. I mean, I grew up in a definitely, you know, not not a very wealthy household by any means. Um, kind of grew up with like just uh, me and my mom. Um, and, you know, so, you know, single parent, she was working, you know, two jobs at a time a lot. And for me, just kind of figure out and, you know, growing up, uh, my grandma as well alongside and just kind of navigating through that figuring it out now i had a lot of parent uh you know parent figures like aunts and uncles and cousins who i saw relatively often you know that's, that's not this that's still not the same it's very different to not have that you know like a like that taller figure a second parent in the house 
um, and one um, with your own like mom being at work all the time. So that development's a little bit different. Um, although I'm grateful the way everything turned out. Um, and, you know, once I, you know, there's a lot of different uh, stories. Me, you know, going to high school didn't, you know, naturally, probably the way I, I didn't really see a whole lot of, um, I guess, benefit in education, right? I knew going to school is good. I knew school is good for you. You need to get an education, get a job. Like that's always ingrained. But the internal true value of it wasn't, you know, wasn't there yet. So middle school was just doing a lot of random things, like going around, um, hanging out with friends, coming home late, you know, like skateboarding, doing things like that, uh, things like that. And um, and I think, you know, that my, my grades suffered like crazy. Like I almost didn't pass middle school. Um, family uncle came and talked to me and said, you know, like, come on, do you need to pick this up together? Um, he was calling every day, coming by, and, you know, he lives 20, 30 minutes away, but still came by all the time to check in. Um, and that's just how much my uncles and aunts cared. You know, like, this is their their sister who, you know, the, the guy, um, you know, my, my dad, he, I think they kind of went their own ways when I was pretty much conceived, and he's in somewhere in Florida now. And so they see, you know, they, they do sympathize for him. They try to pitch in a lot, you know, for me growing up my development. So he would come by a lot and just kind of talk to him. You know, we, we made this huge like jump to leave Vietnam, to come over here, to have a better life, to get away from war, whatever. Right. So that whole story. And it, it, we want to make sure that our family continues this, you know, this, I guess, quote unquote, you call the American dream, right. Coming over here, establishing yourself, getting a living, getting opportunities that you wouldn't have if we didn't flee the country. So, um, so that started click over time and, you know, things rolled around, you know, middle school still didn't pick up that well because it was towards the end, but I got out, got into high school, um, kind of in and out, you know, like I, I started becoming more motivated, but I didn't know how to go about it. I didn't know how to be an effective learner. I didn't know how to study. I didn't know how to do those things. So I didn't know how time management, I didn't have anybody to teach me those things. And then, you know, it just got hard to pay attention to things. Um, so it made it hard to study. And so now, um, I think mostly through high school, grades still weren't there, but I think the mindset changed. So that's a little, a little first step, but I had just enough grades to play and compete when we would travel and stuff and the volleyball team and basketball and whatnot. So, um, and then there are times where it's just like, like a, a perfect, um, example I always remember is I had a teacher in my junior year, Mr. Greek. Um, he was a physics teacher and I was just at the point where there's so many people hawking me and I didn't know who to uh, look up to. I didn't know who to believe. I didn't know who to lean on or trust to get me to become more of like this individual that I need to be. Right. So uh, he made me sit in the front of class knowing that I was just, I was never doing work. I didn't do anything. And, but I would always answer when he called upon me or whatever. He always stayed to class like, man, Chris, like, you know, um, really bright guy, really smart. You know, I can just see it. I can see this, you know, you're trying to learn, you're trying to, but you're having a hard time. I want to help you. I want you to sit in front of classes. Why I always pick on you. You know, I don't want to pick on you because I just, for the sake of doing it, like I would to other students, but I'm doing it because I feel like there's just so much potential and you don't even know it, you know, and I don't know what your, your situations are like at home and whatnot, but I can just see something I want to develop. So he kept doing it over time. And obviously as a high school student, like I started getting a little bit bugged by it because I did feel attacked, you know? Um, so and what happened was uh, end of semester rolls around and the grades come up on the, the screen of the projector and everyone's like I, school IDs are on there. Right. Of course, there's the lowest grade in the class has to be mine easily. Right. I'm flunking all my tests. I'm turning in projects. I'm just doing things that like, you know, to my best ability, but I couldn't get it going. So next to my ID, there's a D. Right. And so I remember class and I, I walked up to him. I was like, Hey, I think you got this wrong. I should have an F. And then uh, he said, no, you don't you have a D. And I was like, I, I did terrible in this class. So, and he's like, you know, like, like I, re I really believe in you. I think you just, you, you're bright. Like I said, you just need the certain guidance. I feel like maybe you don't have it at home. I can just tell. And you just need somebody to get you rolling a bit, you know, somebody who kind of believes. And, um, and I just think that, you know, you're, athletic you're skilled you're smart you're well-rounded you're a really nice guy and you're nice to people around you it's just i just had this urge to pass you you know and he's like i'm not going to give you an f like go and then that really just 
propelled from there. Like everything after that changed completely for me. Um, and then um, actually, I remember one time in class too, like we had to build these these cars and stuff and mine didn't go very far. I actually almost like broke down along the way. And I was just so mad. I took it and I like threw it in the trash. They said, oh my gosh, man, screw it. This is not my thing. I hate physics and math, blah, blah, blah. And then he went and picked that out of the trash and he like kept it in his room in the corner. Like he keeps all like students projects like forever. And he kept that. He's like, no, I liked it. So it's just like this awesome like mentor. I could, you could call coach, right? So later on that like changed my grades went up for the rest of the year, like senior year. And then, um, and then went into, you know, and along that came a lot of being, I mean, I'm only like five, eight, right. So being a small outside hitter, you know, physically you aren't gifted a whole ton. And so, um, just, just going off on a tangent, I spent a lot of time in the weight room on my own and researching, developing a lot of things, just being like just total gym rat underdog. Like, how do I get better? How do I get better? I want to figure out yeah. better. Who are the, What's air alert? I'm sure people heard air alert. <laughs> oh, man. All these workouts, just doing all workouts in like my garage, running around the gym. Every summer, you know, I wake up in the morning, do tons of workouts, just like lifting like couches and chairs and like anything in the house I could jump or do, you know, bench presses with. I would put together like dinner table chairs and just go at nice. it. And so just like, just like a full on grind. And, um, and also, I, I didn't have money, right? So I remember my uh, senior year, went to our couple of first weeks of practice with like size 12 shoes or something, like my, my teammate's shoes. He's like our middle. I mean, I'm like a size, <laughs> oh a size nine, man, size nine. And so I looked at me. You probably know him, David Tran. So he looks yeah. at me. It's like, Chris, the heck are you doing, dude? And like, are you trying to be funny with these clown shoes? I said, no, dude, I just, <laughs> I don't have shoes. And he's like, oh, my gosh, like, I'll get you shoes. I'm like, no, it's fine. And then he came and he gave me shoes one day. And David wow. actually, he's probably going to watch this eventually. Um, him, him and I see each other in contact. And uh, he brought me shoes. And that's another good, like, mentor I had. We became really close. We're still really close. Um, yeah, so shout out to David Tran. And then right. went off to college. And I knew right there going to community college wasn't ideal in our family. So, but I knew it was a, a good fresh start, you know, mm -hmm. starting over, I need to make something out of myself. So start researching, had people kind of help me. What am I good at? What am I really interested in? Like I said, from a young age, sports performance, Gatorade commercials, Michael Jordan commercials, track Olympic games, could not get away from the TV. So I just knew there was something on that realm. And like, you know, throughout high school, middle school, during like track and whatnot, I was, I knew I was a little pretty gifted in that sense. Like I was winning all my races and whatnot and more of the, some of the most athletic people on the court, I'd say compared to my teammates. And so a lot of friends and like from, you know, guys and girls would reach out and say, how'd you do this? How'd you do that? Like, can you teach me how to do this? And you know, friends like, can you train me? Can we go on the weekends to the park and do something? And so I knew there was a sense of calling at some point um, and I enjoyed it. So yeah, and that went on, went off to college, you know, our first year there, just grinded out with our team, underdogs, we won, you know, the state championships, and Golden West College in Huntington Beach, you know, they're, they're good, but they haven't ever really won a state championship in a long time, and mm -hmm. there's a whole underdog thing, I still have the medal, and the newspapers, so that was really cool, we were definitely underestimated that year, and then went on, and when I was finishing school, um, you know, it was super hard, you know, didn't really have a car, I uh, had to figure out phone and internet. I like, had to go places, didn't have money. I, I would save up financial aid and like, man, must serve as much as I can and pay for things. Like I was paying for things yeah. since I was 18 on my own. And that made it really hard to like yeah. balance school and college. And I would like walk to practices to college in the rain. Like it was crazy, man. And then, um, okay. and then uh, just like at the same time, just still sitting for hours at night late, just watching YouTube videos on guys like, athlete and X or like DPTs, mm -hmm. some like strength coaches. And then once college were in a college, one of the university professors at Long Beach asked like, what do you want to do? Like, what do you want to, what kind of people do you want to train? And I told them in every project that I did, it was about volleyball athletes and whatnot, all my research. I like, oh, so you want to do volleyball? So yeah, I want to train just, just volleyball mostly. And then I remember them telling me, I was like, I don't know, maybe, maybe you should find something else. You know, volleyball is not very, lucrative there's not a lot of all I, I just don't advise it and there's just a lot of push away from it and mm -hmm. i told him like no i i figured it out i've i figured out a lot of things on my own um 
and then any you know there's tons of sticky situations i've been where i just know like i want this really bad so i'll yeah. figure it out and so that obviously there's a lot of doubters in the sense of like how is he gonna get a lot of volleyball clients because for them they didn't come from a volleyball world so yeah it was just a lot of me mustering up like a lot of courage and I feel like tenacity and resiliency of just like, this is what I want. I'm going to go after it, you know, whatever circumstances I have, it's just, you know, like I said, it's how you perceive it. So that's just me. I mean, I have a, a whole ton of, I have a whole list of mantras actually I go over with a lot of athletes from the pro and college levels that like I would go through, but I mean, a huge thing is just like, you know, perception, how you view it being really inviting of um, setbacks and, uh, unforeseen unfortunate circumstances because you know that's really what's going to grow you I mean if you take it and you feel sorry for yourself you're not going to get yourself to I feel like where you want to need to be and just you know point fingers and blame on each other um, I mean if you point your finger there's one point right back at you right so yeah. it's really all up to you and so just be very very inviting of these things because it really fosters growth so I feel like you know I don't want to say my whole upbringing in life was like uh, an underdog story but I do feel like there were a lot of underdog sequences of events in there that I was able to um, you know get past and continue to do you know I still I still have a lot of huge goals I'm trying to get at so and um, yeah so I mean I, I do like where I am right now and it took a lot a lot a lot and it still does to get here maintain here but um, I, I guess that's to me that's an underdog story that a lot of people can relate to because it, it's it could be about sports it could be you know somebody who's undersized overlooked who got their vertical up eight inches in like a couple months you know and just doing stuff at home and then somebody who struggled in school but got past it just find the right guidance and then um with career wise you know there's a lot of different setbacks and things you know, i was looking for a job for like two years no calls back or you know one one or two companies say oh you're not good enough we're just not looking for this kind of trainer or yeah so it's it's a lot of setbacks and yeah, you just got to do what's best for you. And I think that's what it is. So I think I, I hit a realm of different um, underdog stories. I feel like that collectively a lot of viewers can relate to because we're not just athletes. We're not just workers. We're also family people. We're eventually educators, parents. So I think um, I still have a lot to learn, but that's just my take on all of it. That's awesome. That's such a great story. I've known you, you know, since last year we first met, I appreciate you um, reaching out to me. But mm -hmm. to know the depth of that story has been inspiring for myself just to listen to. I mean, from flunking, almost flunking middle school to now training uh, one of the, the, the top athletes in the world in, in volleyball and then also owning your own business. I mean, that's it just goes to show it, it, it's about you, you really have to work for it and you have to be lucky with the right people and let mentors into your life. I think we all have people who care about us and it's up to us to allow them to to care for us and then from there it, it can really take off so thanks again for for sharing that story that, that's, yeah. that's really inspiring definitely no problem well i'm sure this is not going to be our first video session we got we already caught a lot of uh impromptu topics we're going to talk about um in subsequent videos but if you guys want to hear us talk about other topics just let us know in the comment section and we'll be happy to do other sessions and give you guys the knowledge uh, we're still learning. We're not the know-it-alls, but you know we've been helped by so many other people. Athlete X, man, that guy is solid. I watch him so much, and I get so much free info. Um, and so we want to kind of pass it on, you know, for those who are aspiring trainers and players and coaches to, to, to help what we in the ways we can. And can you talk about how people can get in contact with you if people want to work with you, if you have online services, and, and if you want to do a plug for your beach program for anyone who's interested in playing beach volleyball? Yeah, so, I mean, the best way to contact me, um, I would honestly leave it more up to my Instagram, um, okay. just so I'm not giving my direct number and stuff. But so my Instagram, you can just DM me, comment, um, whatever it is. So it's at training underscore matrix. Um, I'm sure, I don't know if Donnie's going to post this somewhere at some point, um, yeah. and we tag it on Instagram and YouTube, but, um, yeah, so it's at training matrix, um, kind of just working on a website and maybe a logo at some point to, for a lot of the AVP and FIVB USA athletes to wear on their shoulder. Mm -hmm. So that'll be coming out soon. Maybe merchandise. I don't know. It's just kind of up in the air, but, um, so yeah, training matrix. And then right now. Coaching at Westcliff University, so it's a it's a very new university coming up 
you know, from the ground up out of Irvine. It used to be an online only business and education school. Um, really good stuff. They're, I mean, their accreditation is incredible. It's the same accreditation as you get from schools like USC, UCLA, you know, some really top business schools. So really good stuff uh, on their background for, especially for you, uh, if employers are looking at it. So private four-year university, so not a junior, uh, junior college. And we have a women's beach program and a men's beach program, actually. So like I said, I'm trying to get uh, men's beach up and running with, you know, a, a group of people that have brought me on to make it an official sport in the NCAA. So that's a huge endeavor right now. And I think that's really cool because it gives a lot of uh, obviously college athletes um, the opportunity to go to get an education, to get it paid for potentially through scholarships and to be able to continue playing. Right. And we do, we need that. We need men's beach in the U S because that's what, that's going to be a feeding system for the national team. Yeah. Um, and right now, I mean, with, with the women's national team, they have a great feeding system. There's so many good girls coming out of the NCAA. Men's yeah. beach is a little bit of like people transferring from indoor, whether college or pros um, or from, you know, the indoor national team and so, or like an open tryout or people coming and we're, we're just watching on the AVP and saying, Hey, that guy's pretty good. Right. So um, having an NCAA prog programs across the U S would be amazing. And it just grows the sport of volleyball, not just beach. Yeah. And then it gives a, uh, you know, staff and coaches more jobs. Um, yeah. So right now we're, we're always going to be looking for, uh, girls for the women's beach program here at West Cliff University in Irvine, California. Um, and also for men's, we're a little bit done co uh, recruiting for this upcoming year for women's. Um, we have, a, you know, a nice solid, uh, you know, group of girls right now that we are looking to do some really good things next year. Um, potentially, you know, we're looking at two really big goals we're setting out, which is uh, the conference champs. You know, we're officially in the NAIA now. Um, and we're potentially hoping, you know, we're, we're not playing just in the NEIA, like schools like Concordia, who were in the NEIA for a good amount of time. And then, I mean, they won a couple of national championships and now they're pretty much division one. So, you know, as an athletic partner, that's our, that's our huge goal. So whether, you know, we kind of got in there the fastest compared to other schools and we're hoping to do some big things. So the men's program, um, we're currently recruiting. So still recruiting right now. Um, you know, it's, you can contact me if you're interested, you know, if you feel like, um, you know, you're, you're talented on the beach side and or if pretty good indoor player, but looking to play beach, you know, get in contact, send over some film, um, you know, we can put it up for consideration and chit chat about it and set something up. Sounds good. And I'll leave all the information in the description box for you to check out if you're interested in uh, Athlean, or I was going to say Athlean X, uh, Athlean Matrix, reach out to Chris and then uh, Westcliff University. So. Well, thanks again for being on the show. It's always a blast talking to you and talking to shop. Um, but yeah, we'll definitely do our follow-up videos for this one. Well, awesome. thanks again. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day, Chris, and stay safe out there. Thank you, too. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Take care, Chris. See you next time. See you.